All right, so we are live on Facebook right now. It's uh, Sunday night, eight o'clock Pacific, a little bit late for people on the East Coast. And I have some friends in the UK that saw that I was gonna be talking to this next friend of mine. I am uh, I'm blown away by the amount of hats that this guy wears beyond the, uh, the fact that he's a accomplished actor and voiceover artist. He's also a killer bassist. Uh, so my, <laughs> and I first met playing with Filter about uh, a dozen years ago. In a so, while. Yeah, so ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Bill Buckman. Hi, how you guys doing? What's happening? I am uh, I'm blown away by the amount oh, yeah. that this guy wears. Jan, oh, the- hold on a sec. I've got, uh, I've got my, my, and my laptop filter. talking back. Yeah, that's audio that's me, that's me, that's me. Hello. All right. First met playing with Filter about uh, a dozen years ago. I was trying to do the watch party thing. Wasn't oh, yeah, on. no problem. I'll make sure we tag you in it. Um, I definitely don't need to hear my voice again, but uh, you know, just when we were talking to set this thing up, you had this intro Foley thing happening. Let's hear a little bit of Phil Buckman's uh, intro music. Okay, well, this isn't mine. This is what came with the machine. Hey, everybody, how you guys doing? Welcome to the Mind I'm here with Kevin and blah, 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 and all. <laughs> you know, man, Casey Kasem has nothing on you. Right. <laughs> uh, man, um, you know what? Like I said, you've got a lot of hats to wear. I love doing this completely informally, nothing rehearsed, nothing canned. I didn't really talk to you about what stuff might be off limits. So if there's something you don't want to talk about, you know, maybe text me offline. But I um, I love just the honesty, transparency about the whole thing, you know? Yeah, well, um, it's all good, man. I'm, I'm, I'm down. It's, it's fun. And it's light. We, um, I think one thing I noticed about you the last couple of years is when you started playing with Fuel and mm-hmm. we have been out with uh, Petty Cash, yeah. You've got a John, uh, Johnny Cash, Tom Petty tribute that you've been traveling the world with, right? Right, right. So I, uh, you're, you're great about sharing your experiences online. And I, uh, I do the same thing. It's just fun for me to be able to share with my kids. Yeah, totally. And, uh, and uh, you're really good about engaging with the people that you communicate with. Uh, you know, so friends back home, you talk to them about the road. You meet yeah. people along the way. And it seems like you meet friends wherever you go, right? So it's a... Uh, I, I, to me, that's the best part of the job. I mean, playing music is great. It's a lot of fun. Um, you know, we're you you and I are in a similar boat here. I mean, we're not playing we're we're playing the same songs every night. Um, you know, basically from the same set list every single night. And and it's cool and it's fun and it is a different experience every night. But the coolest part about the job for me is getting out and, and meeting new people or or especially seeing old friends that I would not normally get a chance to see. You know, I have friends from when I was in kindergarten in New York. Um, whenever I go to New York, I, I see and in Boston from when I was growing up there, you know, just I've lived all over the country when I was a kid and, um, you know, I get to see my, my friends all over the place, which is just the coolest. Yeah, that is cool. So you're from New York originally? Originally from New York. Yeah. Okay. What part? Uh, from Queens. Are you? Right on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah I, I, I can hear a little bit of the accent, but I don't see the attitude. Yeah, it comes out every now and then. Yeah. <laughs> Depends on who I'm talking to. How, uh, how long have you been out in LA? Uh, I moved to LA when I was 13. Okay. So I, I grew up here. I mean, um, I'm, I, you know, I'm from New York, but I, I say that I'm from LA. I mean, I moved here uh, to start ninth grade. Okay. Went yeah. to high school there. Went to high school out here. Um, Taft High School in the Valley. All right. Go uh, Taft. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it's funny. We had a lot of musicians come out of Taft High School. Really? A lot. Um, Where is that? Where? What part of the city? Uh, it's right at the uh, Winnetka exit off the 101. Okay. Uh, but like Brad Wilk from Rage Against the Machine. Oh. God, awesome. He graduated a year ahead of me. Um, let's see, uh, some of the guys from Crazy Town, uh, House of Pain, uh, Ice Cube graduated with me. Right on. Um, yeah, a lot of, lot of cool. Uh, I think Fitz from Fitz and the Tantrums, I think he, he either went to my high school or one of my friend's high schools. I knew somebody knew him in high school, but yeah. Did you, did you say you graduated with Ice Cube the same year? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. please tell me. There's a talent show video around of you and Ice Cube doing this. Isn't, things. but hold on. All Here, right. That was occupied. Here, I'll, I'll put you up. <laughs> oh, yes, yeah. this is great. <laughs> the intro music. Okay, look at this. Taft high, high School Yearbook. A high School Yearbook, which... Uh, um all right so let's see if he signed your yearbook today is a good day but but first of all i I just got to embarrass my friend julie um who is oh we got the manual focus happening yeah oh yeah that's right all right so she's over here i'll put this back on all right Uh, 
All right, so my friend Julie, right there. Oh, uh, sweet. Hey, Julie. Out there, right there. Sorry, there. <laughs> okay. That's, that's the, the one who uh, you met at, um, in that, uh, where were you, Dominican Republic? Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, man. Yeah, it's private stuff that nobody else knows about, so who cares? Yeah, um, I, wasn't, I wasn't telling anybody else in the Dominican either. That was the, the surprise. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> it was work-related. It was, man. Met lots of great friends that we'll be doing interviews with from there, too. So, all right, so there is. Oh, the, yes. Right there with the pink shirt. Oh, my God, that's so um, good. Look at that hair. And you know what's even funnier? This guy right here? Yeah. That's my kid's doctor. Really? Yeah. You get any kind of a, like doctor discount for? You think, right? No, but I do get to text him. Uh, I, I do get to text him if I have problems. All right, let's see. That's a, that, dude, that's worth its weight in gold. All right, so me wearing that pink shirt and. Um, oh my God, look at that. Ice O'Shea beach. Jackson wearing his pink shirt. Wow, with a collar popped. I oh, love yeah. it. Totally. Today is a good day. <laughs> <laughs> oh um, um, man. Okay. So we talked about uh, you popping in from New York. I, I, I want to kind of keep a chronological thing happening. So ninth grade, you moved here to LA. All right. Let's, you're going chronological. Let's go back. New York right. to Baltimore. Okay. To Boston to LA. All right. Were you playing music at all before you moved to LA? Um, I mean, I had a guitar. I played drums, but I wasn't, I didn't take any music seriously until I was in college. Okay. Um, you know, I played a little guitar, played a little, a little drums, like I said, and uh, I had oh, got awful band in high school and, um, in college, um, it was a fraternity and we had this like Greek week talent show thing and I was playing guitar in it. We had a drummer and we had a bass player and we had another guitar player and, um, we didn't have a singer and the bass player wanted to sing and he couldn't do both at the same time. And so every time he would go to sing, the low end would drop out and, and finally, one day I was like, I was like, dude, just give me that. Let me, yeah. I put on the bass and was like, ah, oh. I was like, wow. oh, that's what I'm supposed to be playing. Really? In college? Yeah. All right. Yeah. yeah. So I was 19. First time I, I played bass. Were you doing like cover gigs at that point? Original? Oh, yeah. All right. Yeah. We're doing, we're doing all covers at that point. Yeah. We're doing like the cult and uh, chili peppers and, um, geez, I don't even remember. Bang yeah. Tango. Oh, Bang Tango, man. Yeah. Right on. Good stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, it's funny that when I was looking for pictures to help promote this uh, this cast, every time I searched for Phil Buckman pictures, Anthony Kiedis pictures kept popping up. Yeah, what's, yeah. Up, what's up with that? Uh, you know, I, I can't help uh, the way I look. No, you don't look anything like I, that. I don't think I do. Um, not not now, at least. I mean, back in the 90s, you know, we both had the same long hair and then I cut my hair and then he cut his hair and I bleached it blonde and he bleached his blonde and I dyed it back and he, his, yeah, I don't know. Did he also learn to sing on key like you do? Or no. <laughs> I am <laughs> sorry, man. No, I, man, I'm not going to disagree with you, but I have no comment. Yeah, I, I try not to. Actually, it's tough for me because yeah. I, I love Chad Smith and I love Flea. Chad's yeah. awesome. Yeah, amazing. We're cool. Chad's played with Petty Cash before. He's he's great. Really? No. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you never did any gigging with uh, Brad Wilk back in high school days either. No, I don't think I even realized that he was a drummer back in high school. I mean, we were friends, but no idea. <laughs> And it's a killer, you know, killer rhythm section, man. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You, I mean, you two together would be smoking, right? Well, that's funny you should say that. Um, <laughs> this is uh, this is my my musical heartbreak story. Um, so wait a minute, are we going to there already? Oh, do you, would you like to? Why not? Well, or do you want to? Well, I can well, bounce around. You, okay, if, if it's related to the chronological thing. Well, it's not. I'm it's so ADD, man. It's. <laughs> It's all good. Let's just keep bouncing. It makes it makes it more I, interesting. I, I bet you have a bunch of musical heartbreak stories, but if this is the first one, let's hear it. This was the first big one. So I um so I played in, I was playing in a band in LA called Tribal Sex Cult. I had left the band and um we had played some shows with this band Lockup and Tom Morello was a guitar player in Lockup. And he knew that I left the band and he called me and he's like, Hey, um, I'm putting this band together and I want you to play bass for me. And uh I was like uh, what do you got going on? He said, well, I got this drummer. Um, didn't say who he was. Uh, he said, I got this drummer who's filling in with this band called Pearl Jam right now. They're on some tour in Europe. And when he gets back, he's he's playing with me. And uh, and that's it. I'm like, no singer, no nothing. He's like, no. I'm like, okay. Well, I'm, I'm in a band. I just got picked up by a band that's got a development deal with Warner Brothers. Um, and they're, you know, they're buying us strings and paying our studio rent. So, you know, <laughs> so... <laughs> I got to go with that, you know, plus I was, I was working on uh, TV shows at the time. So, I mean, I was, I wasn't really looking to, I, I was fine where I was. 
I cut to um, like a, a year or so later, I'm at uh, a bar in LA and I see Brad and I was like, Hey, what's going on? Like, yeah, no, I'm in a band. We just got signed to Epic. And I was like, that's, that's amazing. What's it called? He said, Rage Against the Machine. I was like, sounds cool. Who's in the band? He said, Oh, this guy, Tom Morello. I was like, wait, what? Oh man. He didn't tell me and the next oh, time I saw Tom, which was a couple of years later, I was like, you didn't tell me that the drummer was Brad. Cause I probably would have said yes then. Cause he was my friend, yeah. but Rage Against the Machine wouldn't have been Rage Against the Machine um, if I would have joined because apparently Zach would not have taken the gig unless he could bring Tim with him. Oh, okay. Because yeah. they were buddies. Tim K, man. Yeah. yeah. Dude. I, it, honestly, you guys have a, a real aggressive, similar style though. You know, I could totally see the the, the drummer in you before you play bass because you've, yeah. you've got that vibe, man. I, I, the, the times that I've seen you play, you really connect with your drummer, which is something that I That's think the most important thing. Yeah. That's the important thing. For us. Far. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, but, I had it with, I was fortunate enough to, I had it with most of the drummers I played with in Filter. I played with seven in my three and a half years I was in that band. Jesus. Yeah. Wow. Um, and uh, since I've been in Fuel, I mean, I've got with Shannon Boone, the guy's a freaking timepiece. He's, he's yeah. awesome. Um, and then Petty Cash, too. Um, you know, our drummer Dylan's, he's solid. And our drummer before him, Ed, was solid. Are you, you know. guys all based in the kind of same area there at LA? Um, no, I, I live further. Well, which band? Um, Fuel, Brett and I, my singer and I live close. We, okay. We're about two exits away from each other off the freeway. Um, our guitar player lives in more Hollywood area. And then Shannon lives in Michigan. Michigan. All right. Yeah. So, well, and, so then, uh, and Petty Cash, most of those guys are Hollywood area. Okay. So yeah, they're fairly close. Yeah. yeah. You're, you're, you're north, right? Aren't you uh, towards uh, like... Uh, Malibu area. Yeah, I'm in I'm in the canyon, okay. uh, Malibu Canyon. So I'm, I'm right in the middle of the beach and the the 101. God, beautiful man. The Topanga, said, Topanga area. Uh, uh, one canyon over. Okay. Yeah. Malibu, Malibu Canyon. You said? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, yeah. I was I was just there. All right. Uh, yeah. When we played down in uh, <clears throat> did Microsoft Theater Valentine's Day weekend. Mm. And uh, that was when I did the gig with Hammer. We'll have to talk about that in a second, because right. I know you've got Hammer stories. I but, do. But uh, a dear friend of mine, Mike May, is a he's a, a Manson enthusiast, not mm -hmm. Marilyn, Marilyn Manson, but he loves he's fascinated by the Charles Manson stuff. So <clears throat> we went up and did uh, you know we uh, the the cave, uh, yeah we did yeah we did the spawn ranch thing and of course Cielo Drive, but. From, yeah. from, you know, from the caves and then popped down Malibu Canyon, went and had some lunch. And yeah. uh, my pal Janine, who's a big fan of yours, I think now here too. She's, I got a lot of uh, female friends that are asking, uh, my friend Julie said, so you're going to do this podcast pantsless also, please? <laughs> <laughs> Why not? I am. No. Yeah. Actually, you are, aren't you? You were in shorts. I think I saw I that. Shorts, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I don't think she was one for shorts, but uh, anyway. Um, I, for bed. I mean. Since, since we're jumping around, man, I mean, you're, yeah. you gotta be in shorts. You're in your bedroom. I am. Look, this tell me about bed. this setup. Look at this setup. This is awesome. Yeah, this is. Uh, I'm. I'm. A, I'm a. Uh, I'm a camera geek. Uh, I admit it. I mean, this is all like this is a, a good 4K camera. I've got another one back up on the shelf there, and another one down on the shelf over there. Um, those are all lenses up on the those shelves over there. Um, it's. Uh, it's. Uh, it's like my my big hobby, and so I have lighting. I have tons of lighting because my studio next door. Haven't done any live music in there in our main room um, for years since I was in Filter because with Fuel, we do everything at, at Brett's house. He's got a studio. Um, so I converted my live room into a photo studio. So I got backdrops and lights and all that. And when when all this stuff started and um, I knew I was going to be doing a lot of Zoom calls and a lot of uh, Facebook Live and, and all that stuff, I brought a few lights in here, put a key light up there, got the can back there. There's a RGB throwing color up back there and just... You know, yeah, no, just that's, just that's, geeking out, and I, you know, I'm using broadcast microphone and into a mixing board that's got the and all that stuff. And, uh, I, yeah. uh, I, you know, all of the funny is that my wife, when she does Zoom calls on here, gets thoroughly embarrassed because the bedroom is in the background. No, 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 because it's like uh, the big production on phones, right. and you know, and and she sounds like she's talking to you from a TV station. Yeah, no, that you know legitimizes Lauren's, uh, you know, yeah. her, her, she's, she's got some cred. Look, yeah. I, I, I think whenever I see a bedroom in the backdrop, I see Parkan 
hands and uh, pink and purple lights. I totally think of the Ron Jeremy videos that we shot, like not that far, that, yeah, that well, long ago. You know, listen, like I said, three cameras. Um, <laughs> you know, we, we make our own entertainment here. These are rough times. Uh, yes, I yeah. get it. <laughs> Uh, you know, um, I have a friend, uh, Jim Jelvig, who's been watching these. He's a, a, great, a great musician, an old buddy of mine from junior high school, who's a mm -hmm. music teacher in, uh, in England right now in the UK. And uh, he knows some of your catalog, but he said, how's Phil balancing being a dad with a couple of uh, beautiful girls and, uh, you know, dedicated family life? He's got his voiceover career. He's, I don't know if you're still acting. Yeah. Uh, doing some, you're doing some acting as well. I, you know, it's funny you say that. I had just started picking up steam with that when this all came to a crashing wow. halt. No kidding. Um, yeah, no, I've got, I, yeah. Um, this past year, I just got back into it and I've done an episode of Mom. Um, I did a, a small thing on the show called Schooled. And then there's a new show on CBS on Thursday nights called Broke. Okay. Um, with Polly Perrette and Jaime uh, Camille that uh, debuted five weeks ago, I think. Okay. Um, I'm in one of the episodes coming up. I'm actually like a, I got a pretty good sized uh, guest star role in that. Like, you know, fantastic man. Guest star role in it, and um, it's funny as hell. And uh, yeah, I love Mom. Actually, it's a great show. <laughs> Mom's That's an amazing great. show. It, yeah. it's one of our favorite shows. And my my wife and I watch it. The writing is so, you know, on point and so smart. S smart writing is the best way yeah. to describe it. It's tough, I would bet, right? As somebody who's acted as long as you have to watch TV without a biased eye, right? You Well, sure. You know, I mean, it's it's tough to sort of separate. Um, so there are certain shows where I, my wife watches a lot of shows that I won't mention where I'm just, I don't even watch them. I'll just hear them in the background. I'm like, really? Those person, those people get work and I, I'm having a hard time like getting jobs. Like, okay. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. That, <laughs> I suppose that happens, but you know, I try to lose myself in projects, you know, or lose myself in shows when I'm watching and not pay attention to acting. Yeah, that's that's gonna be tough. I mean, music's the same way, right? When yeah. you go and you go see a band, and you know there are certain elements of a band, one of the musicians maybe that just isn't spot on, and for me, it kind of kills it, right? Mm -hmm. I can't I can't take my attention off of it, right? And, and uh, you know, especially if there are guys that you know, right? The buddies, buddies of yours, and yeah. They, you know, they thank you for coming out to the show and you're trying to find something diplomatic to say to him. Like, yeah, I love that. Um, I love the uniform that you were wearing during that story. And you guys have some awesome lights. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. And your gear looks just fantastic. Yeah. Dude, that, that thing sounded awesome. What, what are you playing? Right. That, well, speaking, you know, this has nothing to do with that comparison, but the, the hammer thing. Tell me about hammer. What, what was the story behind the hammer deal? Well, the MC hammer. Um, it's, I, you know, I don't know him for music. I know him as an actor. Uh, I forgot the year. I think it was 93 or 94, 95, somewhere in there. Uh, Fox gave MC Hammer uh, a TV show. Uh, was it Fox? Maybe USA. I don't know. Was, I think it was Fox. Um, gave MC Hammer a, a TV show. And um, I was in it. And Hammer played a, a high school teacher. And I played at one of his students. Oh. <laughs> um, I was 25 years old and I played uh, Hammer's, oh yeah, it's 1995. I played Hammer's uh, high school student. It was crazy. It was crazy. I thought that, you know, like I'm 25 years old. I can't pass for a high school student. And then when we shot it and all the extras that were in the room were all of his posse that he used to keep around with him. They were all like 30 and 40. <laughs> I look totally young. I look totally plausible to, to be a high school student. But uh, Don Faison from Scrubs was also one of the students. Bumper Robinson was another student. Um, so I think who else was in that? Uh, Leah Lale, who she went on to uh, one of pa Pamela Anderson had a, a series, a mystery series. That she was like a crime fighter or something like that. I forgot what it was called. Barbware? No, it was a TV oh, that show. That, oh, that was the movies. Yeah, that's yeah, right. yeah. It was a TV show. Um, but Leo, I think Leah was in that. But now I think she's like this huge real estate agent. Nice. Um, yeah. Regular but uh, but yeah, Hammer was. Uh, I, 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 did you get to meet him when you did your, th your thing? No, I, I met every one of those that <clears throat> massive posse that you talked about. You know, yeah. he had like 100 people, you know, his, his entourage. Yeah. And so nobody got guests for our show because they filled up the guest list, you know. But gotcha. Yeah. Right. But but he's a super cool guy. He he was like super nice. Very surprisingly, you know, with how big he was at the time too. I mean, this was at the height of his popularity. Um, real humble. Um, Good and a generous guy. Uh, he took me to Roscoe's house of uh, 
you know, waffles and fried chicken. Chicken and waffles. Yeah, he took me there for my very first time. It was across the street from the studio that we filmed at. No kidding. Yeah. I, I, fin- I finally went the first time myself. With, like, yeah, I, I, once was enough, honestly. Man, I, I, <laughs> I thought it was awesome. But it was good. I just don't yeah. be the, you know, be this physique doesn't look like yours, man. So chicken and waffles. No, mine looks like I've eaten a lot of chicken and waffles. This, this, uh, I, haven't, I haven't seen much of a gym in the last couple of months. You, do, how do you work at home? I mean, do you, do you have a little workout? I have a gym here, but honestly, I haven't done anything. I got a shoulder issue and um, I was about to go to get it taken care of right when this all happened. So I'm kind of waiting for things to die down a bit so I can go at the very least get a cortisone shot. I, I tried just doing a bench press the other day with 25 pound weights. I mean, that's nothing. Yeah. And I, it was killing. Oh, me. man. Yeah. yeah. So, Rotator cuff stuff. I have no idea. Uh, this is this is this is age right here. Literally driving. Turn the wheel. Felt a pop. Turn the wheel felt my shoulder pop oh, oh, and, and yeah and uh, like when it happened i, I, I was like ah <laughs> my, wife, my wife's like what's the matter I'm like, I, I don't know i turned the wheel and i hurt myself <laughs> oh my so God. Bad. phantom old age pain man oh, that's no oh, so that's bad. i mean i'm already part bionic so oh yeah you get oh some, yeah you got some had, metal limbs i had a knee replacement a couple of years ago um I've, I've had eight knee operations i think total Jesus. Six on the one that's been replaced, and oh no, five on the one that's been replaced, three on the other one. Gotcha. Um, yeah, elbow issues, shoulder issues. When I was younger, I beat the hell out of myself. You know? Athletic stuff. Yeah, yeah. I, I um I was a, a martial arts instructor for a little while. Um, I taught Krav Maga at the National Training Center in LA um, about 15 years ago or so. I uh, I was a kiteboarder for a little while. Oh my god, I saw pictures. Dude, you yeah. have so much height off the waves. Oh, that one. I, oh, that, well, I know which picture you're talking about. You know, the funny thing is that was the last time I went kiteboarding. I did that jump. I think I was up about 20 to 25 feet or something like that. Yeah. I came down and I landed it and it was, it was great. And I was like, I, I think I'm good. And I never went kiteboarding again. And I had been doing it for years. But I, I had a bad injury before that. So that was like kind of working my way back into it. Um, yeah, no, I, oh I, had, God. I had, I had, well, bad injury, good injury, depending on how you look at it. I, uh, I crashed through a dock on Easter Sunday in Belize one day, oh. <laughs> one year. Kiteboarding? So, kiteboarding, just cause you know, as you do. Um, and, uh, yeah, I came up through a dock. Uh, it was going super slow past the dock. One of my kite lines got caught on a pole. It was like one of those low Caribbean docks, you know, that you yeah. walk out on to get onto your boat and my kite line my last kite line caught up on to uh this pole that was sticking up spun me around i hit my head on the pylon i was like ow okay i'm all right all right let me back up let me back away the kite flew straight up took my bar went like that slammed on the bottom of the dock broke my finger i was like ow ow okay let me i can i can back it back it off once it gets to and all of a sudden a gust came and it pulled me up through the bottom of the dock oh. at four like nine foot long mahogany boards flew out of the the deck you know you know flew out from from there wherever they're you know how they're anchored in caught me in the face i broke my bone here knocked a tooth out or uh, here um and i ended up on top of the dock and like on my you know my hands my my hands on my knees just like hyperventilating and laughing i was like oh my god was at that point i released my at that point, I released my emergency. Um, and I was just like, oh my God, oh my God. And like blood's kind of starts pouring off my head. My ex-wife um, was on the dock. She came running. She's like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. You're right. I'm like, I'm fine. I'm fine. It's my tooth. Oh, <laughs> oh my God. It, it's lucky that you actually landed on the dock and we're back yeah. in the water, right? You know? Well, no, I mean... I, yeah, I suppose. I, I mean, I, I literally like, pulled up through the bottom of the dock and ended up on top of it and got out of it. I mean, the whole thing happened. It felt like it took forever, but it was pretty quick, the, the whole series of events. Um, and it was, like I said, it was Easter Sunday in Belize. Um, so nothing's open right. for two days. Oh, you had uh, two days to get to a doctor? Uh, I, well, they had a clinic. I was on uh, Ambergris Key, the island, uh, Ambergris Key. And um, so there's a clinic on the island. They're closed, but the doctor lived at the clinic. So they, I jumped in a boat because there's no roads there. You take, you go by boat everywhere. And uh, they took me into town, um, went to the clinic. She came out covered in dirt because she was working in her garden. And um, 
you know, she looks at my, uh, my head and I, she gave me a few stitches and, um, and she gave me a little something to put on my tooth in case it was hurting, which it was fine. It didn't crack down to the root, but it got close enough. And then, um, I didn't know about my broken face until later. Um, so yeah, she's like, you know, you're fine. You know, just, uh, no diving. Cause I was going to go scuba diving, like no diving. Um, just, you know, have drink some beers. That's all you can do is and, and relax. Um, you can shower. So I went back to the, the, my condo that we're staying at and I took a shower and in the shower I went to blow my nose and I'm blowing my nose and I, and I hear, and I feel my face puff up. Oh my God. <laughs> oh, Jesus, man. And I'm like, what? The f-? And I, I like, I, I step out and I look in the mirror and it was like a big, like mouse on my face. I was like, oh, and I touch it and it like slides and all of a sudden I can't see. And I was like, Oh my God. And I push it back down. It was like an air pocket <laughs> between my skin and the muscle. And I freaked out. I completely, I completely freaked out. Cause I had, I had become uh, I was a, like I said, I was diving. So I was, I was a diver and I'd learned all about air embolisms and I'm like, Oh my God, this is going to go to my heart and I'm going to die. What the hell? Right. So I, called, I called the the doctor back and she said, all right, you probably have a cracked uh, sinus bone or, you know, um, she said, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll call the hospital on the mainland and we'll set something up for you to go tomorrow. And so I, the next day we went to the airport. Um, they have those little thir- thir- 13 seater airplanes. Yeah. And I'm like, I tell the pilot, I'm like, listen, can you fly low? Cause I got a head injury. They're like non-pressurized planes, but he's like, yeah, man, no problem. We flew like 500 feet above the water the whole way. It was awesome. Skimming. So yeah, dude, you can see all these like manatees and, and rays. It was beautiful. And, um, yeah, he said, you know, you're probably going to need surgery to fix it. Let's take the x-ray. Took the x-ray. He's like, okay, the bad news is it's broken in three places. The good news is it's all hairline. It's going to heal on its own. You don't need surgery. Um, I was like, should I go home? Should I get on a plane, fly home? He's like, when are you supposed to leave? I said, in like five days or six days. He's like, no, the longer you wait, the more it'll heal, the better it'll be to get on a plane. So wow. stay and just, you know, have some drinks. <laughs> okay. Oh that's, so they, vacation turned into just a you know open bar for the next five days and believe pretty it. much yeah God. watching uh watching my friends kiteboard because uh, they got real good after that and uh yeah man, so it hurts my back to think about it. my back is so jacked right now and i think about going through a dock and even landing from the the heights that you were at on the kiteboard freaks me yeah. out I, I i love heights don't get me wrong man i my bucket list i was this uh my plan was to get certified in scuba dive this year too you know i, uh, I love snorkeling and you know, in the Dominican, went you know snorkel with sharks and yeah, it's just amazing. That's awesome, scuba diving is easier than snorkeling. I, well, I, I have the, this friend of mine that I mentioned actually. Our dream was to go shark cage diving, right? You know, that was yeah, the plan. I'd love and to do that. It was. It, it, you haven't done that one yet. Like, well, that, all right. So maybe you and I'll go because my buddy thought second. He second guessed himself after uh, you know we we started doing the training in the pool. With yeah. The, the tanks and he said i don't think this is my thing man just freaked him out to go underneath you know but yeah it's you know i haven't i i it, it that's another one of those things like i'll do something to the nth degree um and then i'll move on yeah so i literally went through dive um scuba diving and i went every weekend when i lived in marina del rey um i worked uh, you know did, did some stuff out of a dive shop there and i was on boats every single weekend and i went and i got my all these certifications, uh, you know, and the, you know, rescue diver and, and all the way up to dive master. I got my dive master certification and I haven't been in the water since. Really? Yeah. yeah. I was like, all right, I did it. Now next. Man, it sounds like that with jobs too. You've got a, you've, it sounds like you've done a million different jobs. Yeah. Yeah. I, I get, I get, I don't know if it's, I get boardies, not with the, not with the work stuff. I mean, yeah. You know, it's funny, like I didn't get into music at the level that, that we're at, you know, touring and, and, you know, at this kind of level until I, I turned, until I was in, I was 40, really? you know, I joined filter when I was 40. Um, and I quit college at 20 to play music. Um, I joined a band and my goal was to always try to make it as a, as a musician. And, um, I had acted when I was in high school and I had an agent from when I was in high school. And when I came back from college, three years later, I said, I'm back. I look totally different now. I got long hair, earrings. This was 1990. And, um, you know, if anything opens up acting wise for somebody that looks like me, cool, but I'm not cutting my hair. I'm here to be a rock star. That's what I want to do. And it's like, that's all I needed to say. Cause all of a sudden I was a working actor. And I mean, I worked like crazy. I, you know, I, I had to quit a job at a record store when I was 20 because of acting work. 
and I've never had a day job since. Beautiful, man. You know, it's I made, I'm, you know, fortunate enough to, you know, make a living as an actor for, for so long and then sort of fell into the voiceover thing. And then that was an even better living than I, than I was making as, as an actor. And then, but all, all along still trying to do uh, music. And then, um, I was playing in Petty Cash and I was playing in this other band called Volume with uh, some of the guys from Petty Cash and Volume was starting to fall apart like bands will do. And, and I was like, all right, when Volume is done, I'm just, I'm just done with the original stuff. I can get my rocks off playing with Petty Cash. It's fun. It's everybody. It's every song we plays a hit, you know, it's yeah. all the Tom Petty and Johnny Cash and I'll just do that. And, um, and then I, I my ex-wife and I had like, we were done and um, literally I, I was leaving my house to to be gone so my ex-wife could come and get her stuff and I got a text from my buddy Rob who was the guitar player and filter at the time and say hey how fast can you learn 17 songs wow I was like but I thought I gave up on music yeah <laughs> no. right. I was like I don't know tomorrow um so <clears throat> I went in a couple of days later played for uh Richard Patrick and got the gig wow and all of a sudden I was touring the world and Amazing. you know a month two months later I was in Iraq you know playing for troops I yeah I saw some pictures from that that was yeah. what you did USO gigs for them and yeah like USO uh, an organization called Stars for Stripes similar okay. similar right. idea. yeah what, what year was that uh 2010 uh 2011 okay I, I know we're a couple of times I went to Iraq once I went to Kuwait back and forth uh, a couple times uh, i've been to guantanamo bay and then with fuel two years ago a year and a half ago we went to japan to play on bases there we were actually supposed to, i'm supposed to be at a base this this past weekend uh this summer for fuel we were scheduled almost every weekend to be at, at air force bases around the country wow man i um you know it's funny talking to friends and musicians of mine um musician friends of mine on these sort of broadcasts or these conversations our identities have sort of taken a hit during this yeah. whole time, right? Yeah, you know, because uh, you identified as a musician, right? You talk mm -hmm. about, yeah, well, wait, I'm a rock star. Yeah. And and because you and I have that sort of similar connection with people, that it's it's as important to make these networks and or these connections with people. Yeah, totally. When, when that's re removed, right, you've got, uh, it's it's almost as if like a part of you is just cut out. You know, it, I know that you're a really dedicated family man. Um, yeah. You know, my, my boys are my life, my world, and uh, even my ex-wife and I are real close and tight, and I'm grateful to have that. But not having that interaction both on stage with your bandmates mm -hmm. and then I, uh, I yearn for that. A lot of people that have been chiming on the podcast or people that I've met on tour over the years that are just begging for some kind of musical uh, um, uh, distraction, right? Yeah. So, so people that are in their bedrooms and playing acoustic guitar is as close as they're going to get to seeing us on stage. And yeah, it, uh, I, I would bet it's, it's tough, right. To kind of, even though you've got a lot of other hats to wear, man, it's not. The yeah. Same. I mean, it is, it, it, it is. I, I miss playing, although I, I'll be honest, I was a little apprehensive to start touring again this year, just because I mean, my kids are four and they're at this, this age that I just don't want to miss a minute, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but luckily with fuel, our touring schedule is we go, we just do weekends. We do, yeah. I mean, it's almost every weekend when we're in season, but I'm at least home a couple of days a week. I can take them to school and pick them up and, and, you know, have dinner with them, which is, is important if you can do it. Yeah. Um, and then this happened and, um, yeah, I, but, but I do miss seeing people and, you know, I, I get emails from people and I talk to people and, um, you know, it's that, that part is tough. I mean, yeah. um, you know, I'm, I'm definitely not sick of being with my wife and kids, but you know, when they're the only people that you see, I mean, I know my wife's going crazy yeah, because you know, she's, I'm the only person she sees and, and the kids, um, you know, we were doing a little bit of the social distancing thing in the neighborhood. You know, we, we sit out in front, people walk by, we talk to them and slowly, some of our friends are dropping off, you know, I mean, not, not losing their lives, but coming down with, with, with COVID on our street. Yeah. You know? So, so scary, and, and we live in the middle of nowhere and, and, you know, most of the people that live up here are being really good about being careful and, and, you know, not going to stores or, or, you know, doing Instacart and getting, you know, just picking up food, um, yeah. having them drop it off in your car. 
Um, but you know, people are getting sick. So now we're like, we're almost like, we just kind of wanted to stay in our backyard yeah, and not see anybody. And you know, it's, it's freaking it's a crazy time. I mean, it's good that you can see the silver lining, the fact that you can hang with your girls, you know, yeah. and, and uh, yeah, for me too, man, I, I really feel like you know, with, with, without them, I feel bad for people that are alone. Right. Yeah. That's, that's a tough thing. Totally. But, but uh, you, the stories that you're going to be able to tell your daughters, they're twins. You got yeah. two four-year-old daughters. Yeah. When, uh, you know, when they're older, you know, they look back at this time and the time that they got to spend with their dad and their yeah. mom, you know, undivided attention. It's pretty Absolutely. sad. Right. So Absolutely. that time I, uh, the world was sick. That's what they know. You yeah. know, the world is sick. That's all, you know. Right. They, they have no concept of it whatsoever, you know. Most kids don't get an opportunity to spend undivided attention with their families, right? Yeah. Their par- parents for a while. So, yeah, I mean, if you can, you know, see that as a glass half full, then, you know. Something. It is. I mean, this this time is is completely, inv- uh, it's, it's super valuable. Invaluable? Well, yeah. yeah. Um, my wife and I were sitting outside the other day. And, you know, we're like, we're, I'm fortunate. I have, a, I have a nice house um, in a great place. I've got, you know, we have a lot of stuff for the kids to do. There's a trampoline, there's a playground, there's a pool, there's, there's stuff. Yeah. Um, when I moved here 16 years ago on voiceover money, not on, on yeah. money, um, I put everything here because going places was a pain in the ass. Going to the gym, I used to go to a gym in Malibu. It was like 90 bucks a month for me and 90 bucks a month for my ex. And it was great if we were going down the hill that way, but if we're going to the Valley, well, then we didn't work out. So we're like, well, let's just save that money and invest it into gear and make a room in the house, a gym. So I did that. And so this is what I've had for, you know, 15 years. Same um, house. Yeah. Is it, yeah. Yeah. I kept cool. the house. Nice. Um, or should I say I bought the house again? Um, <laughs> I understand. Uh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, no. So I, I set this place up to be where I want to be always. You know, I mean, this is my, this is my, my bedroom. Um, if, you know, I, I play on that ship rock thing. If you guys see the, if you've seen the ship rock, uh, stowaways announced video from 2020, I filmed that in my recording studios. So, I mean, I've got, I've got places to go. We've got space. Um, we feel good here. Uh, and then, you know, with unemployment and the bonus that comes with the unemployment right now, and then the PPE loan, because I am technically a corporation and I, you know, I'm, I'm an employee of myself. Um, you know, I'm fortunate enough that the money that I'm getting through the, the stimulus package is enough to cover what I would have made if I was on tour. Oh, man, that's so good. That's yeah. so good. I, that's, you know, I, I put something out on Facebook a few weeks ago, a month ago, when uh, um, the stimulus, when the PPE loans were starting to be uh, distributed, mm-hmm. uh, asking people not to reply with, details but said private message me if you had some success with the ppe um, i'm a small business owner as well right and a lot of my associates that i knew hadn't been receiving it and i wasn't trying to fish for information i was curious to see because the media will let you know that you know whatever that uh ruth's chris you know gets uh, got yeah. a majority those kind of things were happening and i believe that that probably you know affected a lot of people's uh, you know packages as well but it's fascinating to me to see who jumped on it, who was successful with it, who's been able to be sustainable like you have. And mm-hmm. um, it's, it's nice to know that, you know, there's something out there. I know you probably have a bunch of friends overseas too. And I, I talked to a lot of people in Europe that right now that some countries are really handling this well for yeah. families and businesses, but um, it is something that just from a sociological point of view, it's interesting to see how, you know, it affects people and businesses different ways and what's going to happen in the next couple of years. Yeah. It's going to be different for sure. But Definitely. I, am, I know I, uh, I think my, uh, my biggest focus with my kids right now, they're 18 and 21. Right. And so their lives are disrupted because schools, you know, screwed up with the graduating yeah. seniors and, and uh, you know, like they feel the quarantine is, you know, limiting and they're almost in jail. Right. And, right, sure. and, and it's tough to just every day remind them that, man, we're just really fortunate that we're healthy and yeah. each other. But um, these kind of things, like having conversations with buddies, sharing this kind of stuff is such a nice distraction for people right yeah. now. And they're, you know, and so I, uh, I'm, I'm glad that you've been able to sort of replace any kind of, you know, touring income. Yeah. You know, it's a well, good thing. I mean, also, I, no, no, like, I'm not like, oh, I got $20 million. Like, you know, it, it's yeah, but, the PPP loan is based on 
what your previous income was for the past whatever month. So, I mean, I didn't get a huge amount of money, but it's enough to keep us going for a few months. Yeah. So, uh, you know, lo losing mortgages is the scary thing, right? It yeah. Is. You know, that's, that's another real fortunate thing. I've been here for, like I said, 15, 16 years. Um, we refinanced our house um, last, not even a year ago. And it, you know, dropped our payments nice. almost in half because I had so much equity built up in the house okay. being here for so long that we were able to refinance just on what I owed and didn't take any equity out um, to keep that equity going, but just restructure our, our payments. So, Good. you know, I have a business manager who I, I, I don't have the brains for any of this stuff. I have a business manager who says, you need to do this. You need to do this. You need to do this. And they have steered me right every step of the way from, from you know, since I, since I brought them on to, to run my life, um, basically. And maybe hitting you up for that referral, my friend. <laughs> it's, a, it, it, it. it's they're, they're good people. I trust them with, obviously with my, my financial health and, uh, they've done, you know, he, the guy who owns the company is a family friend. I've known him since I was a kid, uh, good friends with my parents. Um, and you know, they, they do, they do well by us. So nice, man. real fortunate. Well, we know that. And so Lauren and I, what I was saying is Lauren and I were sitting up by the, the, the pool the other day and we're like, we're like, um, this, <laughs> my kid just poked her head in. Nice. Uh, uh, I, I was like, you know, this isn't so bad for us. Yeah. We're all healthy. We're, we're basically getting paid to take a summer vacation in our backyard. We don't mind being home. Yeah. So I'm I, before all this stuff, this is like a, a, a homebody's dream. Right. That, you know, like I'd rather be home than be anywhere. Yeah. Um, and so, we're doing fine. And I know it's, it's crazy and, and not so good for a lot of people. I talked to my friends who are, you know, still have nice homes and, and this and that, but are going crazy and like at their wits end. And, um, you know, my wife and I, here we are seven weeks into this thing and my wife and I still love each other and still get along and, you know, and still we'll, we'll go at each other, but we respect each other to know why it is maybe, Yeah, you know, and uh, we give each other space and we, talk to each other and my wife tells tells my daughters all the time be kind just be kind you yeah. need to be kind and that's you know we we can learn a lot by doing that ourselves absolutely absolutely uh, man yeah god that so i've started i've started just unfollowing so many of my facebook friends just because of all the politics bullshit oh uh, yeah they're throwing so much misinformation and they're so passionate about the misinformation that they're throwing and like yeah Unfollow. I, I could get into it and but they're not going to listen and unfollow i just yeah i can't do it it's it's not worth a conversation i mean there never is a conversation right i mean I, that's what i see too that people are so bent on their opinions everything that they've been sort of brainwashed or trained to think right. that there, there's never a two-way conversation about it you know and so um yeah you have an opportunity to just tune it out you think For me well, you think people would realize at this point that you're not going to change anybody's mind. So stop. Yeah. Yeah. That's exhausting. You know, for me, man, I, I look at all those things you have in your control, right. And there's so much you recognize now with the state of affairs with the pandemic that 99% of everything that's happening is so out of our control. Oh yeah. Just, just focus on the 1% of stuff that you have a grasp on oh. and, you know, and even then it's almost too much, but the work that you do, you and Lauren to be able to talk to each other and kind of, um, it's so important because it does take work, right? To keep the positive attitude and absolutely we have to, but, but the mindset of being kind is really cool. I I've never met Lauren, but you can see that in pictures together. You can see yeah. the kindness in her face, man. And She's awesome. I, I'm, I'm excited for you, buddy. Cause you can yeah, tell awesome, man. I got you guys lucky. are <laughs> just inseparable. It's a cool, cool. Yeah. Thing. I got lucky this that, time. Uh, it, well, you know, I mean, the, the chapters in our past kind of lead us to where we're at right now. Right. So, yeah. Um, I, I don't, honestly, I don't use the word luck a lot. You know, I talk about being fortunate oftentimes, you know, I don't know. Do you know, Nate Morton, drummer on the voice? Um, uh, Nate's a dear friend. We're going to do a podcast coming up here, but, um, he's got just, a, you know, an amazing rock pedigree or music pedigree. And he talked about opportunities that have sort of led him to where he's at right now. And, and we both talked about it, that luck isn't necessarily that, you know, the, the trait that, uh, you want to attribute it to, you know, and being fortunate, but you've worked your ass off to get where you're at. Yeah. Your personal, right. your personal life and your business life. And 
Absolutely. I, I mean, absolutely I have, but not for one second do I think any of it's deserved. I mean, earned is one thing, perhaps, because I, I mean, I put in a lot of time, but, you know, I not deserved. I, I don't know. I, I'm fortunate. Um, I got, you know, 1% talent, 99% luck. I'll, yeah. I'll call it that. I'm a lot of the right place at the right time, meeting the right people. And look, I just did this thing. Um, I got to be vague because I, I can't really talk about right. it. But there's a there's a thing coming out that I um, I'm doing the voice for. Uh, it happened because my wife and I went to a party at our neighbor's house last summer, and one of the guys that was there um, had owned an animation company and was potentially going to reopen a new animation company. And well, last week he did open a new animation company. He called me up and he's like, "Hey, I want you to voice the the spokesperson, the spokes character for this thing that we're launching. Are you interested?" And I'm like, um, "Yeah." Yeah. You know, it's, it's it's all you know and i did it and if i sucked it would have been like great thanks moving on you know and yeah. they replaced me but they you know i got messages from the producers and stuff they're like thank you so much for making that an easy session so that's where the one percent comes in yeah. but it's 99 percent being in the right place at the right time you know <laughs> when you get these opportunities then it's up to you to to grab them by the throat and, and, and take full control and so I've been fortunate enough to get a lot of opportunities. Putting yourself in those places at the right time is really good too, right? You know, right. if you were not you weren't out there hustling or you weren't out there um, being approachable, you know, and honest and and you know, really, I mean, that's one thing that your humility is is sort of unparalleled in the business because you're on the acting side, the music side, and a lot of people might expect that you've got, you know, you're arrogant or pretentious, and that's not no, at all. That no. when, when I first I, met I, you, I can't stand people like that. Yeah, it's, it's funny it's, of them. I can't stand it. And it's it's a rare trait, but uh, it's one of those things that you know my buddies that are on here that are going after you know career in music or um, anything in entertainment, right? Have to realize that the hang is so important. Oh yeah. The, cool. uh, my my son, my twenty one year old son's an amazing drummer, and he's actually a, he's a rapper. He's got a hip hop you know sort of um, uh, fascination. He's got a couple records out, and when we were down in LA at the NAMM show a couple of years ago, meeting all of our heroes, right? All yeah. the guys that just he was looking up to. Um, you know, I was explaining to him as he looked at these people, you see the talent that they've got there, but they'll be the first to tell you that you've got all the chops in the world to make it as a rock drummer or whatever in the business. It's the other part, the intent, you know, the, uh, the, um, you know, the, the, the communication skills and the network and just the ability, the ability to be a good hang 24 yeah. hours a day on the road is, you know, it's what'll keep you working. Right. So, Absolutely. Oh, and you touched on that in the hired gun documentary. I took, yeah. him, to go, I took him to the, the premiere of that. And uh, you had some uh, sorted tales about your time in filter. You want to I did. I did. They caught me at a great time. Uh, <laughs> that interview was three months after I had left the band. So really? Okay. So there was, you know, it, it was still, it was still fresh, but uh, the venom wasn't quite there. And, you know, when I did that too, I also made it a point to, try not to make it personal and i and I, I don't think that i did yeah you know i don't i don't i don't believe that i did it was business i got attacked after that by you know members of the band and um it's funny i saw uh, on their on their facebook page you know phil's this phil's and that um you know he's a he's a backstab or whatever and their own fans were like he didn't say anything you yeah. did he just right. agreed right you know i was like yeah that's tough yeah. I, I, yeah, it was, it was, I mean, I'm happy to tell my story. It was my side of the story. All I said was I wasn't having fun anymore. Yeah. I wasn't. And so um, I was in a very fortunate position where I could walk away. You bet. And yeah. so I did, you know. When you see a, a band that has seven drummers in the tenure of the time you played, that's, yeah. that, that's I was a band for three and a half years. Yeah. Wow. yeah. Two guitar players, seven drummers. My God, man. Yeah. How'd the fuel thing come about? Uh, the fuel thing. So when I was in filter, we did ship rocked, mm -hmm. um, you know, the big rock cruise and fuel was on the boat one year, one of the years that we did it. And, um, I didn't hang out with the guys in filter at all. Um, and Lauren was on the boat with, with me and I had known the guys in fuel cause we did a fuel and filter tour together. And so we just hung out and Lauren and Brett's wife, and Brad's wife, Brad is the former bass player. Okay. And Andy, the former guitar player, his wife, um, all like bonded. 
and and we all and we were all good friends so we all hung out and it was it was literally the fuel camp and lauren and myself wow hung out like crazy and then you know they live like i said a couple exits away so when we got home we were doing everything together and we integrated in with their little group of friends of uh people that they were with all the time and you know going to concerts in the park and parties at, at each other's houses and just having a, a great time together and um and that was it and uh at that point this is after i left filter i was done with the band i i was like i'm just gonna focus on voiceover i'm i'm gonna stay off the road for a while i had been asked to to play in a couple other bands and said no um <clears throat> and then uh lauren was pregnant with the girls and i get a text um I got a, I got a message on, uh, on my voicemail. We, we drove down to the beach. It was on, uh, it was a Friday morning. We had some friends in from out of town. We drove down to the beach. We we're going to go get some, some breakfast and, um, get out of the car. There's a message on my phone. It's from Brett. He's like, dude, it's Brett. I need you. Brad's brother. Um, Brad's brother passed away this morning. Um, and Brad understandably has, has got to deal with some family stuff. I need you to, um, could you learn, learn our set this weekend, be on a plane Monday. We start a tour Wednesday. I need you for like a week or two until Brad comes back out. And I'm like, I played it for Lauren and we're like, it's, well, it's for Brett and for Brad. Um, just a week. Okay, fine. Cause I don't want to do it anymore. Yeah. And, uh, so, you know, I called him and I was like, yeah, I can do this. So, I went home, sat in the studio for the rest of the weekend, learned the whole set, got on the plane Monday, Tuesday, ran through the songs once, and uh, Wednesday played the first show of the tour. And then um, <clears throat> Brett was like, oh, there's some things, uh, it's a little more complicated than that. What do you think about staying out for the rest of the tour? I'm like, uh, <laughs> he had like a panic attack. Brett and I were actually sharing a hotel room um, at that first, that first place. And, um, I woke up at six in the morning in like a panic and I literally just like was staring at him, <laughs> like wake up so I can tell you, I can't do it. <laughs> wake up so I can tell you, I can't do it. And I was like, man, I can't, I can't. Lauren's pregnant. I can't, I, I don't want to be away. And he's like, cool. Can you help me find somebody? So I stayed out for about three weeks, um, and helped him train, uh, our tech, uh, Ryan to, to, to take the, to the job. And then uh, about a week into it, he called me. He's like, man, it's just, it's tough for Ryan to do both. Can you come back out? I'm like, oh. To tech and play. And he was, you got to sing too, right? You're singing harmony. I, I, well, no, at that point I wasn't singing. Andy okay. uh, was singing. Um, I wasn't singing any of the harmonies yet. Okay. I started to afterwards. Um, and so uh, I was like, all right, I can do like the last two weeks of the tour, but I can't do up until because the last two weeks were in and around the the west coast and i could fly in for like three days fly out fly in yeah. three, whatever and so um so i came back for the last couple of weeks and then they're like do you want to stick around I'm like ah, i don't know um i don't you know i don't I'm like well all we're going to do is some fly dates it's like all right i can do fly dates <laughs> and then and then fly dates led to a tour and i was like oh, it's only two weeks i can do the tour and then you know it, was, it just became like it became too much at home um, with Lauren dealing with the kids by herself. And so, uh, I was like, I'm out. I can't, I can't do it anymore. Um, and this is going to, you know, after this run, I got to be done. They're like, okay, yeah, we get it. And then, uh, I lost my Carl's junior gig, oh, which was wow. my big right. money. Maker at the yeah. time. And, uh, a couple of weeks later, they called me up and they're like, listen, we haven't replaced you yet. And we're about to go out. Are you sure? And I was like, okay. <laughs> Yeah. Oh. Uh, okay. I'll stick with it. So and I've been, Lauren's like, yeah, you know what? Yeah. I want to go it. make some money. So yeah. Can, uh, pay wow. it. Yeah, yeah. So it's been four years now. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's okay. Years. Might be a thin year this year for all of us, man. But, yeah. uh, but you know, okay. So built the fuel for four years. That was uh, you know, spanning the time that this Carl's Jr. thing ended. Why don't we touch base on that? So people that don't know, yeah. This, this is a huge deal. One of the things that you, you, you probably know and Phil long before you actually did had yeah. this amazing recognizable voice, right? So you were the voice of Carl's Jr. for how long? I did the voice for about 16 years from 2000. To, yeah. 2000 to, to um, yeah. Wow. Yeah. 2000 to 2016-ish. My kids were one when I lost the job. Wow. Yeah. 
Yeah, you know, it might have been for the right reasons, right? Because you think about the girls getting a little older, the objectification of women in the Carl's Jr. video. <laughs> yeah, you know, I it, it was it was pushing it. I mean, even the, the executive, the, the creative execs were like, this is pushing it, you know. With the stuff but, that they were doing. Yeah, I mean, some of the stuff, some of the stuff became gratuitous just for gratuitous sake. Yeah. Right. When it first started, it wasn't like that. I mean, yeah, there were scandally clad women, but it never really, I mean, I, in my opinion, it was always, these women were in a power position. Right. Even though they were showing off their, their stuff. I think that, I mean, they, I think they came across strong. That's just me. It did get a little crazy towards the end. Um, but honestly, like right before I lost the gig, it was starting to take a shift um, away from the girls and more towards like, celebrating the American worker and um, it, they became like feel good spots. Okay. And, uh, and then a lot of stuff happened that, um, you know, why I lost a lot of politic uh, politicking within ad agency is why I lost it within Carl's jr. Itself. I mean, the CEO of the company left the company because he was being considered, um, was it the commerce secretary under Trump? Um, and then they started, you know, going into his background and a bunch of stuff came out. So he quit. He, you know, he backed out of, of trying to be a secretary and then went, I, I don't even know if you know, he didn't, he didn't go back to Carl's like they had a different, all I know is they've had like three CEOs since I was on the account okay. as many ad agencies and they're still trying to find their footing. And they did call me back for a couple of spots last year, but looked like it was going to go somewhere. And then a new CEO came in and, and went to a different ad agency again. And literally while we're in the middle of negotiating for a, a new something, it gets yanked away again. Wow. That is what it is. Have you had the same VO agent for quite a while? Uh, no, I've had technically in my voiceover career, I've had two. Okay. I was with one company that became a different company. And then I left them and went to a diff the agency I'm at now. Um, I'm at Atlas Talent now. Okay. I've been at atlas for like seven years or something like that right on that you um i know that so much of your business on that side of things is so driven by word of mouth too right yeah, so you a lot of it your 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 you know your voice is very distinctive everybody knows you from the carl's jr voices you've done nbc local as well there in la yeah i do uh um stuff for KNBC. as far as i know it's still running on certain you know certain thing. Uh, we're there for you. If you hear that, that's me. Okay. Uh, uh, I haven't worked like, like physically worked for them in probably a year or maybe two. Okay. Um, but I think they're still running some of my stuff. Um, I did uh, remember the show, the Orville. Yeah. Um, when it was on Fox, cause now it's on Hulu. When it was on Fox, I did all their commercials. Okay. Um, and uh, you know, st I, I've done stuff for CBS, ABC, I've done for all the major networks. That's great. Um, promo work. And then, I don't know, hundreds of commercials. I don't know exactly what my count is. Yeah. That, um, and some animation stuff too, here and there. Oh, well, yeah. Um, you've, you did some Marvel stuff, right? Um, I do. Uh, <laughs> I did some Marvel. Um, I play Ghost in a couple of the video games. That's uh, great. Is I, there did, I just did another one for a, um, some phone game, iPhone game for, for Marvel. Okay. Um, I don't know anything about it. They just called me in the studio, gave me a list of stuff. I'm like, say this. So I did. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a go-to line for your Carl's Jr. stuff that you always go to? Um, yeah, let's see. The, the, uh, the, don't bother me. I'm eating. <laughs> oh, this is all scratch your head. Got it. That's something with this. <clears throat> I shall still in the marble voice there. Hold on a second. No, that's... I could picture the spicy jalapeno burger. <laughs> the spicy jalapeno burger. Without us, some guys would starve. That is, oh, that is so good. It's right up on the mic. I love it. I love it. Yeah, that I am. Um, I had friends actually that went down and did pretty successful runs of VO in LA and have since moved back here to Portland. You know, yeah. they, uh, um, it's a tough market to get into. I think you know the fact that you've been around for a while. It is, but you know the, the the thing about the business now, why why it's actually become really tough for even people like me who were established, is because everybody who has a computer and a microphone and a setup um, can be can do professional voiceover work now, sure. um, and nothing shows that more than 
right now when everybody's doing stay at home, every audition we get says must have broadcast quality studio. Everybody does. Right. So not everybody, uh, not me. But uh, well, <laughs> no, I mean that's that's a broadcast mic, you know, and um, you know, with a noise gate that you can it, it's clean enough to to make it on the air. Sure. You know. Um, but uh yeah, it it's with, with, with when I first started you were in LA, you were in New York, maybe you were in Chicago, right. um, some smaller, you know, San Francisco, Austin, but mostly just those three places. Now it's anywhere. Sure. You know, so you're competing with all the rest of those people that are potentially yeah. going to get the, but the fact that you're not only actually- competing with them, but they, but the, most of these people are undercut oh, yeah, and for- going non-union. So for a job that I normally would have gotten in the past 450 bucks, hypothetically saying $450 plus residuals based on X amount of factors. Now people are like, I'll do it for hundred bucks. All in, right. you know? All and so, in. Oh, and by the way, you don't have to pay into a, a pension and towards health insurance, you know? So it, it's like, it's super hard to, to yeah. do anything in this business now. When the money is the bottom line for these companies that are paying, right? Yeah. Yeah. That, uh, you know, I'm glad you brought that up and we don't have to talk about financials in terms of like what you might be compensated for a gig, but, uh, but you talked about residuals, you know, that's one thing that people might not realize that depending on the market that this gets distributed to, say mm-hmm. you do a local spot for KNBC, right? Your, your market is very well, small comparatively, right? So also a different type of job, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah. So um, something like a, a Marvel game where you're the voice of ghost and you're in a, uh, you know, the, the game could hypothetically go into millions of hands, right? So there, there are uh, downloads and, and streams and and uh, you know uh, product purchases. Mm-hmm. Um, how, how do you work that out? Where you're going to get mailbox money from something? Do you negotiate it? Is your, is your agent? Okay. Well, it doesn't matter. Video games, commercials, well, TV. Well, I mean, it's different. It's different. There's different rules to different things. For video games, it's it's been a big area of contention for actors because I mean, actors will go in. I think um, I think a SAG scale rate for a video game is like 750 bucks or 800 or 900 somewhere in that area and sometimes that's all the actor will make and if they do one session for that game that's all they'll make when these games are making millions and millions of dollars and they get under a grand and no residuals no buyouts and, and that's it um commercials are a different story if you get a commercial it's national network you get paid usage on it and <clears throat> i mean i had I mean, I'll, I'll full disclosure. I had one Carl's Jr. commercial that I knew of um, because it was a special uh, setup. And granted, I got I got paid a different rate because I've been doing it for so long. But I ended up making about thirty eight thousand on one commercial. Oh, that's great, man. And not, that's not saying I made that on every commercial. Of course not, but yeah. Uh, but that was that was probably like the most I made on one particular commercial. Um, and. Uh, you know, you can, you can make anywhere from 200 bucks to that, you know, and for doing the same work. Yeah. You know? Right. So I, I, I don't know. I, and it's not saying to, to brag that I made that it's I, cause I don't understand why I got paid that. I don't understand that. That's, that's why there's agents. And, right. you know, if I knew how to do all that stuff, I wouldn't need them, but I need them. Yeah. Uh, uh, they, they, yeah. They earn their, their keep. I mean, oh. like being able to have somebody that can help facilitate that stuff is, is certainly helpful, but, I, uh, you know, I think for me, it's, it's fascinating because there's so much that goes on behind the scenes that people don't realize, right? Yeah. Like film and TV and in the subliminal marketing that kind of yeah. goes into the message, right? And Absolutely. Like, I mean, Carl's Jr. is like the perfect example of that, right? That, you know, I, I joked about the objectification, but, but sex sells, everybody knows oh. that. And, and I, I would imagine, man, from that era, you, they probably had to have had Carl's Jr.'s commercials like on Super Bowl, right? Like, yeah were you in were you on some carl's jr i did yeah right. i mean i did every for for that entire period that 16 year period mine there was one year in there where i didn't do the commercials they replaced me for a year and then brought me back not even a year it was like 10 months um they went to a different ad agency ad agency brought in their guy carl was like no let's go back to the old guys and put you know so they put me back on but aside from that little uh hiccup i did every single carl's commercial from 2000 2000 until uh when i were 2017 or something like that um minus one okay two sorry there were two commercials i didn't do the paris hilton one which everybody's like oh you were great on that paris hilton commercial 
there was no voiceover on the Paris Hilton commercial. Oh, none at all. Oh, the first one, there was none. I mean, okay. when she did the second one later on, I did that one. But and then they had one commercial that was, it was it was so cringy. Um, and my friend, my friend uh, Vanessa did the voice for it, and it wasn't her fault by any means. But they were trying to appeal to women, and they were trying to market to women um, that were on their period. It was. Bad. Oh no. Uh, yeah. I, well, what was really bad is that I originally recorded it. Um, the, the line was like for the days after those days, like oh. something like that. I mean, well, I was like jaw drop mortified. I'm like, I, I saw the script. I'm like, really, really, yeah. really, really from, from me. You thought you were being like, I, Yeah. Like bring a girl in, you know, or don't do it. Right. And uh, so they ended up bringing uh, a friend of mine, coincidentally a friend of mine in <clears throat> and she did it and got paid. And uh, I don't think it ran very long. Yeah, it was a little on the cringeworthy side. Oh, yeah, I'm sure that the <laughs> the uh, the reaction that people probably had was, you know, there's so much uh, damage control that those companies have to do. I'm sure, yeah. you know, they they've got a PR department that handles whenever uh, oh, yeah. you know, the, the women are, you know, pushing out of their tops and you have a juice drip down their, you know, chest. But no, honestly, though, whenever we would, uh, whenever somebody would say like, we're gonna get letters, it was usually a good thing because yeah. the negative publicity the negative publicity for most of those commercials were great. Yeah. Well, it just helps. Right. I mean, oh yeah. You know, what sells, man. Is, Completely. Is there a voice gig that's like a dream gig for you? Um, yeah. You know, I, I would love to give um, <laughs> my friend Reno has, ha, I think he still has it. I don't know. I don't listen to much network TV, but he was the voice of NBC does everything on NBC. Um, <clears throat> but at the same time, a job like that's called the golden handcuffs. Can't leave your house. Right. Ever. You have to be ready to go at a moment's notice. You know, they call you up and they're like, here's your script, be on in five minutes. You know, right. Okay, gotta be there. Wow. Um, I had a job like that for a little while. I was, I was one of the voices um, for CBS for, uh, for a couple of seasons and it was, it was a great, great job. And uh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. It became what you wish for, huh? Yeah. I mean, it, it was awesome. I, I, I mean, to the point where I was in filter at the time and it was like trying to balance all this stuff and, um, I actually missed out on shooting half of one of our music videos because they needed me. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I can't be on set. I got to be wow. here. Yeah. God, I, you know, I, like I said, I don't know why I want to get into the finances too much, but what I remember um, about that was uh, if I could talk a little bit about it, I know in Hired Gun, they had this, they painted <clears throat> the picture of Richard Patrick's experience with Nine Inch Nails and <clears throat> uh, Trent, you know, it was Trent's gig, right? And yeah. so everybody else that was in, Nine Inch Nails was basically a very sparsely paid uh, hired gun. And then Richard said, you know what? Yeah, I'm not going to take 50 bucks and riding in the, sleeping in the van anymore. I'm going to go off and start my own band. Did hey, a nice shot. And then essentially did the exact same thing, right? As uh, Yeah. They, but, and, I, I mean, sort of. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm really not trying to like dig no, into no, no, that. No, no, I know. I know. But th there was a lot of there was some misinformation on his part in that, uh, in that movie. Okay. I mean, when he said like, look, I'm not going to pay you a lot of money and I'm going to do this. That was never said to me. I actually was told I was going to get paid a lot more than I got paid. Okay. Um, it was when I got my first paycheck. I was like, uh, this is half of what I was told I was going to get. I'm like, Oh, that's just for the show. And then, you know, for more, you know, the other shows you'll, you'll go, oh, never went up. That's like, got, all right. The, the reason I brought it up was because, if you're getting a bunch of mailbox money, right? You're doing the voiceover work for all these other gigs and yeah. you got to miss a filter video shoot, or you're maybe not, you know, you're, you're, um, you're trying to balance out, right? Cause music is obviously not about the financial reward as so much as it is about this fulfillment, but you know, you're being paid pennies on the dollar or you're out on the road spending all this time and energy yeah. and you can go back in and do something you're also very good at, but be compensated for something that's a little less uh, grueling and, and maybe uh mentally torturous right? yeah yeah no absolutely i mean and i did it and put up with it as long as i did because i had spent so many years trying to get to that point and i finally was doing it and aside from aside from dealing with certain personalities i was having the time of my life yeah you know see it I, I first saw you man i like i'll never forget it yeah i mean on stage in that band i had so much fun that music uh in filter was is so aggressive and so much fun to play um you know a lot of people musically now know me more for fuel which i love it it's great um yeah. 
and the music is obviously great, but I'm I'm definitely more of a harder player. Like mm -hmm. I, I like more heavier stuff. Like I'm, you know, you see all these things of people doing all these uh, isolated uh, recordings with different people. I'm I'm supposedly I I mean I think I'm doing one with uh, Phil Demel from uh, you know from from Machine Head and yeah. Violence. Um, like he and I are putting it together right now. Awesome. Like, like I just want to play something heavy. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, nice escape. Yeah. And so, so it was, it was just so much fun to, to play in that band. And I, I was having a blast until the moment I talk about in hired gun where I'm on stage in Germany and I'm literally rocking out. And I just kind of like, I felt the wave come over me and I stood upright, you know, kept playing. And I just sort of, I turned to Jeff, um, Jeff Fab, who is in black label society. Now the drummer for black label society. Um, he was my drummer at the time. And I just yelled over to him. I'm like, this isn't fun anymore. And I hadn't seen him for a little while and ran into him on, on a ship rock uh, again. And um, when he, he had been fully entrenched in black label and I, I think I was, I was in fuel at that point. And um, I hadn't seen him in years. And I was like, I was like, so do you remember that moment? He's like, totally remember that. Cause I was like, the way you said it was kind of like scary. Like yeah. something's going to happen. Yeah. It, you know? It's amazing. Did you finish the gig? I finished the tour. Yeah. I wow. did the tour how many and more then, dates after that do you remember i don't i well i did the europe tour and then um we had a, a tour set with stone temple pilots um and so i didn't tell them that i was going to quit i did this i started the stone temple pilots tour and then in that tour i said at the end of this tour i'm leaving yeah you know i just I, and I, I and it wasn't like you know fuck you guys it was just sure. like i'm just i'm done i'm gonna i'm you know thanks it's time to move on and you know they they begged me to stay. Um, They're like, please don't leave. It's going to be whatever. Cause they, they had this whole other tour um, booked, and you know I I had already spoken to the Carl's Jr. people, and I'm like, no, I'm gonna because they were having a difficult time with me being on the road. They wanted me in studio. Um, they weren't embracing the technology that we have now. Right? Are you uh, trying to do anything on the road from there? Just, like, oh, like oh yeah, no, I had I I I would never have taken a job as a touring musician if I couldn't record from the road. Okay. Because I knew this is how I was making my money. Yeah. So I always had a portable recording set up with me um, from day one. Um, and so, uh, you know, so they're like, no, please don't go. We're, you know, we'll figure it, you know, we got to figure something out. So I made arrangements to do the the next tour. And, um, you know, like I, I put a lot of people out because of it. And then we had like a few days off between tours. And while I was at home in the studio, I get a call from, my rep for my amp company is like, dude, what the fuck's going on with your band? I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, I just got a call. They need a, a duplicate rig for you. Uh, a duplicate bass rig sent out ASAP with cases. I was like, oh, these guys are trying to screw me over. They're trying. And it's exactly what happened. They wanted to be able to say that they fired me. Yeah. They didn't fire me. I told them I was quitting. I, I mean, they, you know, they were posting all this stuff about how they fired me. I was like, well, it's funny that you fired me. And the guy that's replaced me, I found for you. Yeah, <laughs> I brought, yeah. I, you know, I'm the one who, who sort of you know, sent him the stuff and trained him what to do. Um, but cool. All right. You know, uh, that's mad. You know what? It's such that, I mean, that story is told over and over again. And every, yeah. you know, part of the, every, every band, it seems like it's almost one of those VH1 behind the musics where well, it's the same plot every time. Right. Yeah, and and cool. I, uh, you know, um, is it's much just like you might have, you know, resentments or, or built up. I mean, that stuff takes a long time to let go of, but, but you look at the chapter that that had and what yeah. it led, led you to, right? I mean, the yeah. feel good gig wouldn't have happened probably totally. had it not been filter. And uh, were you with, you were with Lauren when you were out with filter, right? How did you guys I, meet? I, well, I, Lauren and I, our anniversary of dating is in March. I joined filter in May. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it was like, <laughs> it God, was like, happy uh, yeah. Yeah. recording she, she still says you know here we are 10 years later she still says you know i i didn't sign up to be with a touring musician you were a stay-at-home voiceover guy <laughs> that's that's what i was doing that's the, um, yeah so we met we met behind the whiskey um really yeah behind uh, the whiskey yeah behind the whiskey you know um you know marty o'brien yeah of course Lisa man Ford. yeah yeah everybody Lisa knows marty Lisa Lisa Ford Ford. now yeah that's yeah it. Yeah. Um, so Marty and I were friends and we had just hung out at the NAMM show um, and we were going to see his nephew, Dave, play bass for somebody at the whiskey. So I 
drove to the whiskey to see see um, to meet up with Marty and uh, his friends. And I parked my car. I get out of my car, and the girl that Marty was sort of seeing at the time, she gets out of her car, and Lauren was was with her, and she walks up to me. She's like, she's like, hey. And I'm like, yeah, hi. <laughs> I don't know who she was. I I was married at the time. I was not looking for anything. I mean, um, granted, my my marriage was on its last legs at the time, but. Um, she uh you know we we just started talking we became friends we and we were friends first um you know um this was in january and uh around february is when i i kicked my ex-wife out and um then uh you know i'm like i I think i'm ready to date you know because i had spent the last year of my marriage like that was my morning period like when i finally kicked my wife out i was like i'm ready to move on with my life you gotta go and um I was like, I, I think I want to, you know, get out there and be with somebody. I mean, I haven't I've been with this person for 10 years and, and, um, I knew Lauren liked me. I was like, cute 20, 25 year old. Um, yeah. you know, why not, you know, yeah, right. why not, you know, have my rebound be this cute little young thing who, who likes me. And, uh, yeah, so she's my rebound and, uh, <laughs> 10 years and two kids later. Yeah, man, um, adorable like, little girls too, man. Your your daughters yeah. are so uh, no surprise, right? Yeah. Got good good genes. Yeah, you know they take after their mom. They, yeah, um, but you know, but it, it it is like you know, ten years in, and I'm still like, okay, this is what it's supposed yeah. to be. You know, man, it uh, you know, it's a sorted story to get to there. You know, I mean that that, that it's a you know for most people, right, to get to. Yeah. The chapter that you're at where there's some makes her a lot of humor too because she's a lot younger than me so you know, yeah. she's 15 years younger than me but you well, look so young nobody knows right well like, it's the truth man you could still be I, a high school I, student in hammer's class i'm 50 yeah i know that's great i um i know one of my friends had asked about you being pantsless on the uh the interview yeah. um and said uh you know but i keep forgetting that i'm older and i said you know phil's 50 she said, what? There's yeah. just no way. Yeah. So that, uh, that it's in your favor, but you've taken good care of yourself, man. Yeah. I, you know, having, having the young kids really was a kick, a kick in the ass for me too. You know, I, not that I was letting myself go, but it made me really, um, buckle down on, on my health. And, um, you know, I stopped drinking, uh, almost a year and a half ago and it's not, it wasn't for sobriety reasons. It was yeah. for health reasons. I, I was like, I'm going to take a month off. Um, just to like kind of, cut up and get a little fit and I was like you know I don't miss it I don't need I mean I'm thinking about now like maybe going back and having a, a drink here and there but I still haven't because yeah. I, I feel better when I don't yeah man. um you know I don't if, if you do you do I don't care you know I, I tell people like yeah I've been sober for almost a year and a half like oh good for you I'm like no <laughs> no it's not that it's just uh I chose to try to get healthier yeah for the right reasons healthier man. choices yeah yeah, yeah I mean but- your, your right, daughters that for other vices, you know. Your daughters are four. Yeah. As they get as they get older, and you're modeling behavior for them. You know, I mean, for me. Well, too, like, I mean, look, <laughs> you know, Lauren's got her daily her daily cocktail, yeah. so we don't worry about that. Um, but it, but I, but I do want to make sure I'm here as long as I can be for them. Yeah, man. You know, I, I, I almost eight years for me, as a matter of fact. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, my but my guys are older than your daughters, but for me, the biggest part of it was that knowing, you know, we had some predisposition in the family, and and I mm-hmm. thought man, I don't need it for sure. In our industry, it's expected, right? You know, it is expected. And that's where I was doing all my drinking was on stage. Yeah. yeah. You know, I wouldn't drink before shows. I wouldn't drink after shows. Um, or, you know, like I would drink like, like right before we go on stage and I would open a beer as I'm walking off stage and I'd get off stage. And I'm like, I don't want this. What, yeah. like, it's just while I was, while I was on stage and, um, you know, the, the, the pluses for me, the pluses to not drinking outweigh, the minuses yeah. you know, i mean stupid things like if we if she and i were drinking together it would be a lot that much easier for us to get into a stupid fight for no reason sure you bet you know? and i recognized it so it, is it worth it to not have a drink so that we don't get into a, a dumb fight yeah absolutely i'd rather yeah. i'd rather not yeah no. um, yeah, you hear about so much, you know, domestic issues. There's so many yeah. domestic issues happening right now in the pandemic. You know, like everybody's oh. drinking more, everybody's around totally. each other more. Yeah, totally, totally. I mean, 
you know, if, if I were, I, I had thought about this before, you know, before my 50th birthday, I got a lot of really nice presents, like really expensive bottles of tequila and whiskey and stuff that people just didn't know because I don't yeah. make it a big deal. Um, and then they find out like, oh my God, I'm sorry. I'm like, no, 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 I will drink it one day. I will yeah. jump off of this wagon. Um, but for now, and, you know, I thought about it in the beginning when this whole pandemic thing started and I was like, this would be, for somebody who hasn't drank, this would be the worst time to go back to it because I'd be doing it for the wrong reasons right. and I would easily fall down and go into a bad place with it. So God. more reason not to. And, you know, Lauren, she'll, she'll have, she drinks like a cocktail a day, if that. Um, and, but she, she knows her limitations. She likes one. She likes one fruity drink. She was a bartender, so she likes to make her cocktail. Yeah. I think it's more ritualistic for her than anything. Does she have a go-to? Um, I don't know, no, because she, she likes to experiment and create. Like right now, there was like, Today I saw muddled strawberries, mint, and lemonade, and vodka. Um, wow. You know, a she, refreshing summer drink. We're sitting out, uh, you know, under the umbrella out by the pool. Hell yeah! Yeah, absolutely. You know, I'm looking at her. I'm like, do it. Yeah. Oh man, that's uh, strawberries. I'm putting whipped cream in that. She's got her cocktail. Everybody's happy. Yeah, but <laughs> that's mommy's drink, and you guys get your own little cocktail. But exactly. Now she the kids. She got. She's taught the kids how to muddle. Really. <laughs> yeah, they think they got they they've got good skills, man. Like you yeah, know, you know, we have a we have a mint plant, so they go <laughs> mint and they muddle it. <laughs> oh, God, that is that is all. Awesome. When when other daughters are like using the Fisher Price bake, baker oven, you're teaching them how to muddle. You know, mint, yeah, mint. exactly. <laughs> and, Melissa and Doug will bark it. You know. Oh my God, that's awesome, man. I um. Uh, I'm excited for you to be able to still be working at this point. You know, the VO work is still coming in for you. All right. Yeah. You know, it's, it's that because of the way the industry has become, it's definitely slower, but I'm pushing, you know, Yeah, yeah. About to do it. And you've got some other Avenue for an outlet and you're not able to get on stage yet, but uh, you got time with your, your fam and you can roll right out of bed over there and get right on the mic and do your, yeah, video. I can. I can. Well, no, my, my, my voiceover stuff's in the studio. This is, this is like, this is a broadcast mic. This is for talking to right. people. But my voiceover mics, I have two of them. They're in the studio, and that's a soundproof, like right. full isolated. You got a full isolation booth, and you're yeah, uh, yeah. Well, I, I recorded in my control room, but when I when I built that, it was a guest house when I bought the the property, and um, I uh, I jackhammered the foundation of the control room so that it's not touching the rest of the studio. Oh, nice. Um, so it's free free floating, and then I floated all the floors on rubber biscuits and built walls within walls, and I mean, nice. I have a neighbor just down i have a, a creek as my property line just on the other side of the creek she had no idea how to studio there and i've had bands recording at two in the morning no like, kidding yeah, bands recording in there oh, uh, so you did, are you engineering over there i mean i not anymore but when okay. i first when i first moved here when i first built the place that was my my goal was to have it as a studio that i would rent out okay. i wasn't engineering but i would rent out the studio to people and um yeah but we had we had bands that would like fly from new york and record here wow uh, and you know the band Ages? I don't. Uh, Kemble, who's in Petty Cash, his his main band, Ages, uh, they they recorded their first two records here. Um, so, I mean, we've had a lot of different bands come through here. But, yeah, Lynn, my neighbor, wow. clue that it was a studio. I'm like, are the guitars keeping the She's like, what guitars? I don't hear anything. I'm like, this nice. is a studio. It is? Nicely done, man. Yeah. My neighbors are not happy with us right now. I'm sure. <laughs> the drums everywhere. Um, you know, and sure, yeah. I, I put some isolate, you know, some soundproofing in, but uh, no, my neighbor next door, my my uh, my ex-wife called it the Krabby Lady. You know, it was notes all the time, and I actually went through the neighborhood because there were a few police officers down the down the street that I talked to first. You mm -hmm. know, so I made sure they had my phone number, and I said, you know, if it ever becomes an issue. Yeah. Call, call me first. Right. Yeah. You know, but, uh, but yeah, I don't That's know. What I did. I said, look, if you ever, if the noise ever bothers you, let me know. I'll, you know, just no. Don't uh, hear a thing. That's a gift, man. That's beautiful. I love yeah. it. Yeah. I, I, um, uh, you know what? I would love to, uh, I'd love to be able to catch back up with you when the pandemic clears and just see how things change for you musically, you know, schedule wise, obviously fuel, yeah. On, you know, like all of us, right? We don't have an end date for when we can actually go back and perform yeah. again. Yeah. I would bet that most of your gigs that are probably having postponements, they are looking at the fall. And yeah, yeah, but, yeah. We'll uh, see. I have no idea, you know, and you know, I'm, I'm, I don't want to go out until it's safe, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's <laughs> you know, man. You talked about the Shiprock cruise, the uh, the '80s cruise, the pop stuff that happens uh, out of Miami. Mm -hmm. It's. uh 
first week of March, late February, almost every year, um, Flock got asked to come because uh, Brett Michaels and let's see, Brett Michaels and B-52s, I think canceled. Mm-hmm. They were des- desperate to get a fill-in band last minute. So they called us, threw crazy money at us to try and go do it. And yeah. it was that first week of March, right? So the pandemic was hitting everywhere else. Right. It wasn't, we didn't have floating cruise ships full of dying people <laughs> at that point, right? But I was kind of pissed that we couldn't do it. I'm like, man, you're like, we, they can use the dough. It sounds like, yeah. great. At, you know, I'm in Portland, right? Where it's rainy all the time. I thought, yeah. I really want to go where it's sunny, go to the Caribbean. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. The, the ship came back. Lots and lots of cases of coronavirus on there. On the boat. And, on the boat. Yeah. yeah. I mean, when they came back, actually, they didn't find it on the boat. But when people came back, mm. all, lots of musician friends of mine actually came down, and and thankfully, you know, from what I'm hearing, people are still they're recovering. I haven't heard about anything fatal, but um, but it's, it's amazing how I don't know about for you. I didn't see the severity of it, you know, until about that point, you know, when you could see that it jumped to the U S and it was becoming a global thing, you know, but yeah. I, uh, <clears throat> and, and up until that point, I was just kind of bummed out that I was, you know, going to be missing some shows, but at this point it's, you know, it, it's anybody's guess when we're all going to be playing again. Right. But, uh, but it's cool that you're doing this. It sounds like you talked about you and Lauren actually setting up a podcast for the future. Yeah. Right? Yeah. We were talking about doing a podcast. Um, let me, uh, I'll read you my little one sheet because it's the okay. best way to explain it. Um, hang on. Where is it? Here it is. <clears throat> Untitled Tarantino Buckman podcast. Uh, Actor, blah, 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 uh, Phil Buckman, along with his wife, singer, Lauren Tarantino, are going to be launching an as yet untitled podcast that discover, that discusses the good and bad of raising a family in 2020. The show will be raw, funny, heartfelt, and real, and will feature a lot of guests, some famous, some not, sharing their stories, secrets, and tricks of raising families in today's world while trying not to fuck up their children too badly. <laughs> There may or may not be wine involved. Oh, that's fantastic, man! I, yeah, I, yeah. Well, that was I. Uh, I can't wait to, to check that out. You, you uh, have you started taping? No, we haven't at all. We're still we we we're still. <laughs> the first we, that idea came when in the first few weeks of this this pandemic when um my um my mother in law was here with us helping out with the kids. So Lauren and I had some time to like sit and chat and we sort of discussed direction and and format and how we we're going to do it. Then she went back home to her house and it's just been us with the kids. And well, we haven't had a moment of time yet, um, but we're going to, we're going to figure it out. We, we were talking about it actually today. We're like, we need to sit down and figure this out. Um, you know, the semantics of, of recording it are going to be tough too, because we want to film it yeah. and we're going to do it next door in the studio and, you know, have a set built. And like I said, I've got lighting and stuff in there. And, um, but then what do we do with the kids? Right. Yeah. You know, can't leave the four year olds alone in the house. Just keep them muddling the uh, mint. Keep them muddling mint. That's right. Yeah, for, for hours. Pile of mint, muddle that. When you're done, find yeah. some more, muddle that, muddle the yeah. bread. Yeah. yeah. Go harvest the strawberries in the back. <laughs> and, uh, I, uh, well, you mentioned that Lauren's a, a singer as well. I didn't know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. She's a singer songwriter. Um, she's most, I mean, she's a singer, but she's mostly a songwriter. Uh, okay. Like, stupid talent. Like yeah. she pulls vocal hooks out of nowhere. I've written songs before that I no idea what to do with. I wrote a song once, um, 1996. Uh, it was, I thought it was a good song, but I couldn't come up with a melody to save my ass. I put it in the back burner. Um, one day I was playing it for her, like early on when we started dating, she starts singing a melody. I'm like, are you freaking kidding me? Wow. It was like, it was an amazing, yeah. An amazing thing. She has, um, a band that she uh, she and her friend Shannon have called Better Off Blonde. Uh, they've nice. been a little inactive for a couple of years, but it's a comedy pop duo. Okay. That also did a country record. Okay. And dude, the country record is hilarious. They have a song on there called Why Is Steve Naked? Okay. They, um, they, they were in Nashville. They went to Nashville to write with a bunch of songwriters and every single meeting they went into, like, no, 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 we want to write with, for you guys. We don't want to, you know, so they ended up writing a, a whole like EP, country EP for themselves in a week. And really? Songs, yeah, and with like heavy hitter songwriters who, of course, I can't name. But uh, this, I mean, why is Steve naked? Whiskey Richard. Um, oh, nice. You know, hashtag homewrecker. I mean. Oh, my God. They're hilarious. Is that released, that EP? Uh, I think it's on. I think it's on iTunes. Okay. Maybe, I don't know if actually she's got. Uh, there's one record on iTunes called blackmail tapes which is all funny stuff too but you can see like this the video for uh why is steve naked is on um 
It's on YouTube. Okay. And the Better Up yeah. Blonde is the band? Yeah, Better Up Blonde with, with an E at the end. But okay. what, everybody go watch this video just because, I mean, aside from it being a good song and a, and a funny video, um, but see if you can fit, if you see if you can see that she's seven months pregnant with twins in the video. Really? She was seven. Oh my God. You can't tell. Wow. She's got a beach, ba a beach ball, a purse, hiding behind a couch, you know, all the things just to, to hide the fact that she's pregnant, but you can't, you can't tell. That is awesome, man. God, I love the fact that you guys are navigating this thing together. You know, yeah. one of the things that, you know, people had asked about how you balance all this stuff, you balance the VO work and the acting and the music, and then being a dad before this was going on with the pandemic. Mm. You said that Lauren, you know, is primarily just like, she's handling time with the kids the daughters like all the time they, yeah they, they, she's, they basically she's 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 the captain of the ship man wow she's uh she runs this house and runs it well and like a well-oiled machine and she's not afraid to whip my ass in shape if i step out of line yeah you gotta um, have that and you know what it's great <laughs> it's honestly it's awesome uh there's no power trips in this house um she's good at it and yeah better at it than I would be. So I defer to her on a lot of things, you know, and I absolutely let her steer because if I try it, I screw it up. She does a great job. May as well go with the great job. Absolutely, man. And the daughters can see, you know, oh, yeah. a, a strong role model right there too. Man. Oh that, yeah. No, that's a, that's a good win. Yeah. She's an amazing role model. I, I, uh, I knew that we'd kind of get into more stuff about Phil Buckman, you know, than I ever knew about before, man. But uh, I, I've just, I've loved what you share, you know, when you are doing your Facebook lives, it's like I said, man, it's authentic. It's sincere. You really have a great connection with people when you're out there. And, you know, it's my, like I said, it's my favorite part of doing what I do. The fact that um, we're in a job that gets to put us in front of people and we get to interact with people. We're idiots if we don't. Yeah. You know? Um don't want to take it for granted, right? No, not at all. Um, I'll tell you, when I was a kid, I was, I, I got, you know, I was fortunate enough to meet a couple of rock stars um, and unfortunate enough to meet a couple of rock stars. And I remembered the experiences with every single one of them. I remember who the assholes were and I remember who the really good people were. And throughout my entire life, I always said, if I ever get into a position where I'm, in, in a role model sort of sort of position, I'm going to do what I can to make, at least for kids, especially for kids, to make an experience, yeah. something that they will remember. So, you know, on stage, I'm, we have kids in the front sometimes, you know, like I make it a point to give them picks, uh, uh, get down, high five them. Um, if I'm walking to the stage and there's kids there, I stop. And if they're little kids, I get down on my knee, they like talk to them face to face. Um, you know, and, and I get... I, you know, the, the coolest things I get sometimes are little messages saying like, you gave my kid a wristband and he totally made, he, you know, he slept with it for a week and, you know, made it, made his summer and whatever. To me, that means a lot because like I said, I remembered what that feeling was for me when I was a kid. Yeah, man. And the fact that I could do that for, uh, for a kid now, it's like, it's humbling and it, it's, it makes this job worth anything, any other, you know, but more than any other part of this job. Yeah, man. You know that 20, 30 years from now, that kid is going to be talking to people later on, talking about the experience they had with oh. Phil Buckman. How oh, it changed their life, man. It's a, I, I, um, I, I did the same kind of thing, you know, early on. And even, you know, just in the sort of formative years of me really wanting to pursue music as a career, like Dave Abersees from Pearl Jam, actually, yeah. man, the guy took me under his wing and just really treated me as a kind friend. Brought my girlfriend and I out at the time for a week to stay at his house and just yeah. kind of just um, opened my eyes to what, you know, what true star, what true, like being a rock star is all about, man. Not, not the flashy yeah, you know, yeah. cars, cars and money thing. It was just about developing a relationship and then shining on stage, man. I, uh, I love that you do that. And it, uh, it'll be fun to see you, you know, get out there on stage. Do you want yeah. to talk at all about one of the experiences that those people that you met, like the really good positive experiences, who was one that just changed uh, your perspective on what it meant to be a, Oh, when I was a kid. Yeah. Um, I don't know. You know, what, what, this is kind of this is sort of like a backwards uh, version of this. Uh, Dave Hubeck, the guitar player, former well guitar player from Molly Hatchet, he's okay. since passed away. My my best friend when I lived in Boston was a concert promoter, and did a Molly Hatchet concert. So we had dinner with the band, or you know at least we were back there while they were having dinner. And you know I'm kind of a smart ass, and and I was 
mouthing off whatever and he and he just kept calling me a little wise shit ass the whole night nice. i was 12 and that was like the coolest thing and he was i mean they were so cool you know the drummer bruce grump he uh he and i were talking about skiing um <clears throat> you know something i was into back then i mean just stupid things but yeah. enough to make me at 50 remember the conversations i had when i was 12 yeah you know yeah man um, i also remember you know a, a certain face painted mega rock star who was not so nice when i was younger and um you know that <laughs> tainted an image of a of a of a band that i had worshipped when i was a kid you know because i'm from queens new york they're from queens new york yeah um i had a yeah. similar experience but much later in my life but yeah uh, with but the- i'll tell you who i did have a good experience with in that band was uh paul stanley what a beautiful man huh? he's a sweetheart Dude. all right so his son evan um the older son uh-huh um is a guitar player and a great guitar player at 13 he was a great guitar player um at 13 he was in a band called jupiter's ring my friend's uh kid was in the band too and um i got them i gave them a studio to record in i hooked them up with the guitar player in the band i was in at the time who was a producer um to do a demo for him and so they're at my house and <clears throat> and paul uh paul stanley comes to my house to pick Evan up, you know, he comes rolling up and he comes in the studio and, um, you know, he's on guard. He, he's, you know, he's a rock star. He's, he's totally on guard and used to people getting in his face and all this. And, um, I'm like, this is like the only chance I get to talk to Paul. So I'm going to tell, I'm going to pick his brand about things that only he would, you know, he and I would know. And I said, um, I said, I'm sorry, I don't mean to be rude on this, but I go, how old are you? And he's like, why are you asking? I said, well, uh, you're older than me. I just want to make, I, and I'm pretty sure you're younger than my, my mom. I'm asking because you went to PS 164 in Queens, right? And he's like, yeah. Um, I said, well, my mom had a teacher that I had when I was there and I'm, you're in the middle of the age. I wonder if you had her too. And I said the name, he's like, I think I might've. And like, once he, once he realized that I was like a kid from the neighborhood, you saw his shoulders drop Oh yeah. and his demeanor relaxed. And he was just bullshitting with me from that point on. And it was just, it was just like two guys from Flushing, New York, chatting. God, you thought, or he probably thought, uh, you're going to tell me that your mom, that you were conceived about. Yeah. yeah. You know, well, it was, I mean, it was, it was, you know, he, he's just used to people. You know, my, ex-wife, my ex-wife, ex-wife was here at the time. She was like, well, at first he was like, he's kind of like, whatever. I'm like, the guy's been famous since he's like 19 years yeah. old. As Just, famous as you can get. Right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. he's used to people, you know, jumping all over his jock all the time. Yeah. Of course, yeah. he's got to be on guard. That'd be so tough. Yeah. Right? You know, um, I was talking about Nate Morton earlier, that drummer <laughs> for the boys. Yeah. Nate was Paul's uh, solo, you know, when Paul was touring 10, 15 years ago, mm-hmm. doing his solo tours again. I think uh, Rockstar Supernova had just been um, on, on TV. And mm-hmm. so Nate was the drummer in that band, the house band. And Okay. They, Paul just said, I want that band to come tour okay. with me. So he just took the band, the house band. And oh, nice. Touring. And Nate has so many amazing stories about what a kind person he was on the road. You know, yeah. you look at, you know, you talk about past experiences that maybe weren't so positive on tour, but his were so favorable, you know, and, and you love hearing that, right? Because yeah. I've, I've I met Paul a couple of times working some Kiss shows and, and uh, he, while he had to be on guard because everybody, even on crews, were trying to talk to him and get yeah. pictures and that kind of thing. He certainly was, uh, you, know, um, you could tell that there was a, a real warm heart in there, you know, that uh, you would think, man, it'd just be too easy to be cold and, and you know, and stoic after this yeah. much time. But but uh, but I like seeing that. I love those yeah. stories, man. I, I'll take the positive stories about rock stars any day over. Oh, you know, right. Because we, we've all met the shitty ones too, you know, yeah. but but if you met the shitty ones first and they left enough of an impression on you, mm-hmm. chance, chances are, man, it would dissuade you from wanting to do this for a living. Right. You know, and yeah, I, for, for me, that's why I quit for a while. Yeah, man. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. I, uh, I'm grateful that there are cats like you out there, man. I really am. Yeah, I, 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 I think filter for bringing you to Portland. So I get to meet you for the first time. You know, what's but, great. That's the only time I've buddies of mine were in the opening act. And I remember oh, you coming down, hanging at the merch booth. Yeah. <laughs> left the shirt off which everybody appreciated <laughs> yeah. That, yeah that show that was a bird body's pan was it was of- nicely done yeah thank you that was the first time i played without a shirt on really 
there was a very and there was a reason for it it was there was nothing to do with me wanting to like strip it off whatever we went off stage after the set um and then you know we were going to come back out for the encore and and it was so freaking hot and yeah. that like i had my hands on my knees and i'm like just like trying to catch my breath and the sh- sweat just dripping like 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 someone was pouring water over my back and when i stood up my shirt was all like pull i'm like oh my god this is so uncomfortable and rich had been trying to get me to play with a shirt off he's like dude you should got the muscle you should play with the shirt i'm like that's no i don't <laughs> do that and um and so i i i did i'm like i can't move like literally like my arms were being tied from my you know my shirt so I took my shirt off and I just played the show and blah, blah, blah. I didn't think anything of it. And then Mika Finio, our drummer. He's a wicked drummer. <clears throat> he's a great drummer. Yeah. After, after the show, he comes up and he goes, did, did you see what happened? I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, when you came out there with a shirt on, the girls in the crowd all came to your side. It's so true, man. I was like, I, I don't, I didn't pay attention to that. I don't know anything <laughs> oh about that. That's and, what we love about you, man. That humility. I just don't, I didn't, I don't care about that stuff. But then, but then Rich goes, yeah, you gotta leave your shirt on. That's gay. Oh. And I like, I hit a nerve. And then I, I, I became known for not wearing a shirt because there was a tour that we did with um, Chevelle and Bush uh-huh. that I didn't wear my shirt once. Oh my God. On, um, and, and I didn't care. We played some, we played at the masquerade in, in uh, Atlanta, the outdoor stage and it was freezing out there. And I still went out w- with a no, no shirt on. And that was just um, to piss him off. <laughs> yeah, there was, we had, we did play one show in Texas that was so cold that I, I had one of those full body suits, like those, those, uh, what do you call it? Um, you know, like the stretchy material body suits. Okay. And I wore that. So like, you couldn't even see my face. Um, oh, oh yeah like the like the whole it covers your whole head it's like, yeah like, yeah, yeah. one of those with like a, a, a filter hat and a and mask and you know, and snorkel and snorkel i can't even think uh um a snorkel mask <laughs> i'm tired man no uh, a scarf and a, and a jacket and um like you literally can't see my face so it was either that or every other show was no shirtless at all and at the i'll never forget this after the last show of the tour um we're all we're all out by the buses having drinks. We were nobody was leaving until the next morning. So there was like a campfire or whatever. And Dean Bartolini, the bass player for Chevelle, he's like, Hey, can I can I talk to you for a second? I'm like, Yeah, what's up, man? <laughs> he goes, he goes, you know, you're you're a really good bass player. I was like, Th- thanks, man. He goes, Yeah, you don't need to you don't need to go without a shirt for attention. Oh my god. And I go, I go, I start <laughs> laughing and I go, can I tell you why I did that? <laughs> he, was, he was like, yeah, I go, because Rich fucking hated it. <laughs> oh, God, that is awesome. And he goes, oh, that's pretty funny. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, that, that was it. And then, you know, and, you know, in Fuel, I, I think I may have played without a shirt on like once or twice because of the same reason, like, it was, like, stiflingly hot and it couldn't move, but I preferred to I prefer to keep my clothes on. You you pull it off well, man. I, uh, I, I, I'm glad that Burbadis was the kickoff point. That's you know, if you can remember Portland for something, then that was a fun night. We had um, well, Voodoo Donuts. Uh, everybody was telling us about Voodoo Donuts, and they were closing, I guess, when some of the guys in the band went over there. So after hours, or like when they're about to close, they'll sell you a five gallon bucket. Still do it. Ten bucks. Yeah. Yeah. So we got a bucket of donuts on the bus. <laughs> and- we just put them everywhere and everyone just take a bite and just oh take all God. of the donuts. <clears throat> it's kind of, it's kind of sad that that's what Portland is known for now, you know, but yeah. the guy that started that company is a, a buddy too, man. It's yeah. genius, you know, cause now they're in Tokyo and you know, oh, right on. Austin, you know, Voodoo's it. I think you got them in universal down in LA too. So, oh really? Yeah. Oh no. Yeah, Good but, uh, yeah. Well, you know, he, he did all right, man. That's I don't awesome. know if you know this, the story of where that started. I don't know if you know, but uh-uh. Trace Shannon was the guy that started this company. It was a, a tiny closet. Like it, it held two people at a time that they could come into the counter and buy donuts. And he just did it after hours, but they started doing it underground. They were selling donuts with like Benadryl in them. They were like drug donuts. Oh, and, nice. uh, and, you know, so people got into the nostalgia of having, you know, like this, these, uh, you know, like um, 
you know, like hallucinogenic donuts and <laughs> Playboy did an article about it. And it was, uh, you know, some sort of just like bizarro before Portland, Key Portland Weird was kind of a thing. You know, it's kind of like, like check out what these guys are doing. And of course the FDA came in and said, you can't freaking put drugs in your donuts. And they, you know, had this crazy fines, but because of the publicity, it blew up. And so then it grew into the franchise and he's done very well. And I think he sold his share off and is just now kind of an acting sort of manager, but, uh, but yeah. yeah, it started off as drug donuts. Yeah. You know? so, all right. So, it's a good story. Yeah. That's a good story. I, uh, man, I, I took a lot more of your time on a Sunday night than I expected to, but you, no, I, 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 could I talk knew forever. when I first started, we could, man, but yeah. I feel honored that you literally talked to us where the magic happens, right? When all the, uh, the behind the musics in, uh, on MTV, they talk about, well, here's where the magic happens in my bedroom. Yeah. This, this is legitimately where your magic happens for you. I'll move the mic. Yeah. It's my bed right there. Yeah. That's it. But if the magic happens where, you know, putting food on your table here too, then yeah yeah, yeah. I, I love it man what's what's your uh we, we can wrap it up with a, a dream gig we talked about your dream vo gig but uh, mm -hmm. do you have a like a band that um, alive or dead would be a, a bucket list for you oh i mean not to not to disparage nate mandel by any means because he's awesome but i would love to have been the bass player in the food fighters mm, yeah i mean those guys look like they're having fun every moment of every no day have you hung with girl at all uh, I haven't hung with him. I met him once um, and I had an in to talk to him. Um, he's been in, in the press lately for he's doing this thing called Acoustic Youth. Okay. Uh, it's um, there's this therapist, um, Brett Derman uh, Genzel, who's a, she's a child psychologist. And she was watching, um, she was watching uh, Sonic Youth or uh, what's it? What was his, not Sonic Youth, Sonic, uh, one of his, uh, documentary oh about, yeah right about the, the, uh, the sound studios not not that one the other one about about doing you know going to a city and writing the story um, oh right that's right immersing himself and then writing the song about it that's right in each city. So she, she came up with an i an idea um about doing something like that with with kids um that that are troubled and and um and she reached out to dave because i guess their kids go to the same school um and you know, said she wanted to do a program based on his show, but with music. And he's like, awesome. I'm in. He was a mentor for that first group. Wow. And um, so he, you know, he, he gave up the studio um, 606 studios to, for the kids to record there. And they, and he helped them like write songs based on, you know, use, you know, as an outlet for their, their things that they were dealing with. <clears throat> and Brett's a, a friend of mine. Um, I've known her husband since college. And, um, so she told me about it. She was you know, telling me about it. I'm like, that's awesome. I want to be involved. She's like, well, why don't you be the mentor for the next group? So I mentored, I've now done two or three of them. No kidding. Uh, and then Dave, yeah, you know, Dave and I kind of go back and forth. And I think Paul Stanley may have done one because um, Paul's kids go to the same school. Um, and so I was at the, uh, the Ronnie James Dio, uh, the bike for the rockers right, ride for Ronnie. Yeah. And the petty cash was playing. Oh, that's right. I saw clips of you guys playing that gig. Yeah. And Grohl was there and um, he was talking to people and I, I just went up to him and said, listen, I'm sorry to interrupt because everybody in the world is, uh, but I just want to introduce myself. I felt like, you know, I, I took your place in the mentorship for things like, oh my God. And he was, couldn't have been nicer. Super cool. You nailed his voice actually right there too. <laughs> oh yeah. Hey, what's going on? Man? Yeah. Yeah. I can totally see you guys playing together at some point, man. You know, he was, he was super cool. And then I saw him again at the, uh, the bowling thing, the, the Dio bowling event. We were a couple lanes over and he saw me and was like, looked like he kind of knew who I was, but I wasn't, he was being swamped. He was in a bowling team with uh geezer Butler and oh, Eddie God. trunk. And they were just being mobbed in there. And I was like, yeah, screw them. I'm focusing on my bowling. And we yeah. won. thank you very much. For Good. Um, Another hat you wear, man. You're, yeah. <laughs> I'm horrible at it. Um, <laughs> Uh, Brian Tishy, you know Brian. Oh, Trump. of course, man. He yeah. was, he was like, he was on our team, and he, he was like in your face. He's like, come on, man, be the ball. Like, he, <laughs> be the ball. He was our, he was our cheerleader. He made us win. He lives uh, right around the corner from you, doesn't he? I don't know where Brian lives. I think he lives somewhere close by. Yeah, I, I just watched his. Uh, he was riding this mountain bike up the up the canyon. Just oh, I saw, I saw him riding. I saw videos of him riding the canyon. It didn't look like any of the trails that I know, but I, okay. I you remind me, I've been meaning to reach out. I'm like, where is that? Because. I'm basically across the street from Malibu Creek State Park and the oh. trail closed. Oh, of course. Yeah. yeah. Like the MASH site. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Know, 
Um, I, I ride to the match site from my house. Really? Uh, on my bike, yeah. That's cool, man. It, it's awesome. Amazing <clears throat> area there, man. It is. And speaking of the foods, like Taylor Hawkins and I are supposed to go mountain biking. He's a big mountain biker and he lives close by too. No kidding. Uh, yeah. God, that's great, man. That, yeah. Good rhythm section, man, right there. You yeah, I would love to play with Taylor. He's he's a machine. That guy yeah. is so incredible. He's one of the best drummers out there. That's actually what I one thing I talk about about Shannon, my drummer in fuel, is that his style, his loose style, but the pocket is so deep, reminds me of Taylor. Oh, that's great, man. God, yeah. I, I have not gotten to see you play live with fuel yet. I really I can't wait, man. It, it's I, fun. It's a good show, you know. Um Shannon on drums, uh Brett obviously, uh Scallions on vocals and guitar. And then our guitar player is Jason Womack, and he I've been playing with for 10 years in Petty Cash. Oh, wow. So, nice. When the guitar spot opened up in Fuel, I, pu I pulled him in. Um, and like just he and Brett are a lock. You know, they're a perfect fit. They sound great vocally together. They play amazingly off of each other. God, that, man, Brett's voice really is held up. And from what I've seen yeah. in clips, you know, like that's, yeah. it's a tough thing. I mean, you know, the, the, when that band was, was breaking, he's got a very distinctive voice too, you yeah. know, and, clips that i've heard of are, are killer man yeah. I, I saw him back with eve six and uh um i think they were with everclear back in the mm -hmm. day you know it uh yeah. uh you know a handful of shows out here and jonathan moover had done some stuff playing yeah. for farm and so I, I saw clinics with him and who was uh, awesome He's a good yeah guy. good player He's a good, man great player but awesome guy too yeah I meet him a couple of times right on. glenn sobel yeah do you know glenn well i've known glenn forever yeah yeah. You talked about Marty O'Brien, right? Glenn was the first one to introduce me to Marty. And man, I, he just, uh, he's a dear brother of mine too, man. I, yeah. We're doing part two of his cast on Wednesday night because oh, right we, we just couldn't get through it all one night, I, you know? Yeah, I see that. Yeah, give him give him my best. I Glenn and I, we, we met actually right around the same time that Lauren and I met, but I had known about him for years and he'd known about me for years. And we just, our paths had never crossed. And then literally right around that same time at the whiskey, you know, we were all hanging out out there at the time. Glenn and I started becoming friends and I remember he was like, yeah, if you know any gigs, man, let me know. Like, right. Now, right. Got, you know what, man, that's the same thing. You know, I first met him. Yeah. He, uh, it blew my mind, right. That he was such an amazing player, but the right gigs weren't coming to him. Yeah. And, and I was protective of him. It was a friend, you know, I'd get kind of pissed that he was typecast as like this metal guy. Right. Yeah. And, uh, I, um, I was playing with an emotion at that point. Remember that band? Yeah. So he, we did a, a show called "Hit Me One More," "Hit Me Baby One More Time," mm -hmm. on uh, on NBC, and I, uh, I I kind of I was a little embarrassed to bring him down to the taping of the show that we were doing because I'm like you know kind of lose some metal cred right if I walk down and I'm doing yeah. the, you know and um I uh, I remember him saying you know what man <laughs> doing what you're doing right there is what's going to keep you working the rest of your life man you know it's not about those crazy chops and I uh, I appreciated it you know the fact that when we went out like that night it was the first time i'd ever been to the rainbow right yeah. took to the rainbow and you know just like you he can walk into a room he doesn't work the room he walks in and he makes friends with everybody people know him and everybody respects his his uh, abilities but he's not the hollywood guy that walks in and feels like he's got to like talk you up to try and get an angle yeah. to, tr to make something happen even when he told you maybe you know hey if you know any gigs happening it wasn't like he was trying to network and work the ladder, right? Yeah, he, no, he's, just, all, yeah. Like, he's a he. It blows my mind that <clears throat> he's such a humble, you know, self-deprecating. He's not self-deprecating. He's just very humble. He's he's yeah. really uh, he knows his abilities. Not yeah. arrogant and conceited at all. He smokes so many drummers on the planet. Yeah, but but it's not about that for him, man. He's just such a great hang, you know. And I, the Alice Cooper gig is so That's big for him. So great, gets man. to showcase all of his like flash and stuff that he does. Yeah. Totally. But still needs a solid drummer. And Alice is like, Alice is one of those stories. I mean, I was an adult at the time, but one of those stories where I met a guy and was like blown away. The the experience will stay with me forever. Um, the first time I met Alice. Um, yeah, just the coolest. It was an acting gig. Really? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Gene Wilder used to have a TV series called Something Wilder. And one of the episodes, Alice came in to play his next door neighbor. And I got hired to play Alice's assistant. Really? So, yeah. So I get to work with Alice for a week. Wow. For and, a week. Uh, you know, I get to the set on my first day. I started like scary. You know. I love it. It's good. That's what it's all about. It's a funny story. So <clears throat> um, I, I'm, I'm talking to his actual assistant who I'm playing. And um, he's like, oh, Alice just got here. Would you like to, you want to meet him? I'm like, yeah. And um, 
so I walk up, I walk up to him and he introduces me. He's like, Phil, this is Alice. And before I could say anything, he's like, Oh, Phil, I loved you. And and he named almost every TV show I had been in. No shit. He he had been friends, he was friends with the producers of a show that I was on at one point. Um, so he's like, I know this person, this person from that show. And oh, I saw you on Married with Children and this and that. And then uh, like I'm I'm I felt like that scene in Wayne's world. Like literally, yeah. we're not we're, I'm like that. <laughs> Floored me. It blew me away. Super cool. Super nice. Yeah, I love Cut it. to uh, 20 years later, I'm at a, a Grammy party at the John Vervato store on Melrose. And um, it's packed. You know, it's a small store, completely packed. Um, and I get there and I go into the room and I'm just looking at the room and Alice is on the other side of the room. I haven't seen him in 20 years. And I was like, oh, shit, there's Alice Cooper. And you know, like there's this part person, this person, this person. <clears throat> I'm like, oh, that there's there's Alice Cooper. I wonder if I wonder if he'll remember me. And he's scanning the room and he sees me and he's like, he's like, like waves to me. I'm like, what the <laughs> like Alice 20 years later, the dude. So I make my way over to where he is and I was like, I was like, hey Alice, I don't know if you remember. He's like, Phil, how you been, man? What's oh going God. on with you? Yeah, I like, holy shit, that was that was that was incredible. Then a couple of years after that, I'm in filter and I'm on the road. I'm in Columbus, Ohio, and the place we're playing, Alice had played the night before. And um, on a whim, I call Glenn. I'm like, I wonder if they're still in town. So I called Glenn. I'm like, dude, I, I saw, I see on the marquee, you guys were here. Are you still in town? He's like, yeah, we're driving. I'm in a car right now with the big man. And we're, you know, we're, we're heading back to the hotel and what, hold on. Oh, it's my friend, Phil Buckman. Okay. Alice says, cut this rock and roll bullshit out and get back to uh, acting. Oh my God. That is, <laughs> that is so awesome. Yeah. Oh no, my God. It, yeah. That uh, man, well, it doesn't surprise me. You know, I know from what I've heard, Coop is a really down to earth, yeah. real guy, but, but you make that impression that a lot of people, man. Yeah. You know, if you weren't that kind of guy, people wouldn't remember you, you know? He's, he, he's just, I mean, I appreciate that, but it, you know, I, I've been fortunate enough to become friendly with almost everybody in his band and, and, he, and they all are so appreciative. And I mean, they're, they've become big rock stars on their own because of him, because yeah. of, of him pushing them to be as such. And, you know, Jason Hook from Five Finger Death right. Punch, um, you know, throws accolades at him all the time because help make him who he is. And I mean, Alice is, if you saw Hired Gun, none of that was bullshit. I mean, Alice is, that's, that's Alice. He's the, the most giving, nicest guy. God, I yeah. love that. Yeah. We, need, we need more coops in the world, man. You yeah. Know? Honestly, but you know, you're, you're paying that kind of stuff forward too, you know? I, I think, uh, you know, he's being, a great role model for that stuff, man. I wish I were in a bigger position so that I could make a bigger impact, you know, but yeah. uh, you know, I do what I can. The mentorship thing is really cool, man. I, I applaud yeah. you for doing it. You know, yeah, it was fun. It was, it was, it was, it, very rewarding and i made um you know i got i got a lot out of it i mean i helped these kids but i got a lot in return um you know they're you know brent's like thank you so much for no thank you for all that stuff i mean yeah. it was great and, and you know time uh you know hopefully i'll have the time to do another one um they're, they're time consuming but they're they're really rewarding i know dave was doing some more i think there was a i think modern drummer did an, an article on it really okay one of the drum magazines and girls on the cover um with uh, you know talking about the acoustic youth I, I think that's what it's called okay my brain's not working right now but uh yeah it's so, a pandemic brain you can blame it on coronavirus yeah, i'm like i'm losing my mind yeah also, we all are. also 10 o'clock this is the latest i've stayed up i am sorry man yeah no, I didn't, no, I didn't it's all good i'm to, enjoying I, it i could talk to you all night man but you know what let's do this man i am uh, I'm not sure, you know, whether or not I'll just continue to do conversations like this after the pandemic, but I, I want to, you know, I'd love to be able to take this, even when I'm out in the band, on the yeah. tour with the band, I, uh, I, you know, as you know, man, you meet so many amazing people out there. And I think for me to be able to share the experiences, I think it's just fun, you know, so yeah. let's do this again, man. But after, uh, after things clear up, it'd be fun to catch you out on the road. Maybe we'll do a little catch up and, and, uh, and see you slay at the fuel gig and, and, you know, I, I, um, I just applaud what you and Lauren are doing. Thanks yeah. for, for tell her, thank you for sharing oh, you for a couple of hours. You yeah, know, and, she's probably, she's probably in the other room watching vampire diary. She's obsessed. It's really oh, cool. nice. That's, but, uh, that's, uh, yeah, no. Um, and for anybody that's watching, just 
follow me on uh, my other Facebook, my main Facebook page, which is who is Phil Buckman. Cause when we get back on the road that I uh, broadcast from stage, um, a live stream, I'll, I'll go on live like five or 10 minutes before we go on. <clears throat> I'll have you back there with us um, with one of my stupid geeky camera gimbals. Love it. Um, make it all cinematic and uh you know you see us doing our little warm-ups or whatever and intro music i walk you out on stage with us put you on my amp and you're right over my shoulder for the whole show that's so cool man that's awesome yeah and you mentioned too that you're going to do a um uh sort of a simulcast thing with uh cats or machine head coming up is that right or can i talk about that or no um well it's it's phil demo we're, we're not not a simulcast but you know you see all these people doing a video um of them uh, you know, everybody's playing their instrument in a different place and they're recording separately, but then it all is put together and put in a video. Um, yeah, Phil Demel and I, um, from, you know, Phil from Machine Head and Violence, um, we're talking about doing a, a, a song and we're just, okay. we're looking at, we got a couple of players that we we're talking to and we'll see, uh, we'll see how that goes. But um, I'm sure so, they could find that on your, who is Bill, that Phil Buckman. That will definitely be on my Who Is Phil Buckman when it happens. I think I'm actually going to record my part in the next couple of days. Awesome. That's um, cool. Yeah. Man. Hey, buddy. Thank you so much, man. It's yeah, really it's my pleasure. Thank it's you so much. It's fun to catch up, man. I, uh, I can't wait for this thing to be over so we can come and watch you rock again, buddy. Awesome. And, uh, I'll try and get in shape so I can bring my mountain bike down. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, dude, let's do it. With you. Awesome. Um, All right. Well, listen, have a beautiful week. Tell a lot too. of things. And, uh, man. Ladies and gentlemen, go see Phil Buckman. Who is Phil Buckman on his Facebook page? And um, we'll, uh, we'll uh, watch for some upcoming acting stuff too, okay? We'll play out. Oh, do you want to give us a voice out? You want to give a little voiceover out to a... Uh, what are you calling your show? Just All Access yeah. Live. All Access Live. You're listening to All Access Live right here on Facebook Live. I don't know how that. I love it. That's so good, man. Thank you, brother. Have yeah, a man. great week, man. I, I love catching up. Right. Same here, man. My best to your family, man. Thank you, buddy. Take care. Bye. Stay healthy. Bye. Bye-bye.